Uh, those that are joining us for lunch, there is a route that's on your map to go ahead and allow you to come for lunch. In addition, we will have food trucks out front. If you are in the, the need of a bathroom, we do have bathrooms on all three floors. Uh, they are directly outside of this auditorium to your left. Uh, we will be offering facility tours of the entire Innovari Advancement Center on Thursday at noon at the end of the workshop. If you are interested, please go ahead and see any one of the GI staff members out front to go ahead and add your name to the list. Uh, it is my pleasure to go ahead and introduce your MC over the next two and a half days and Deputy Director of AFRL, the Information Directorate, Dr. Michael Hadek. All right. So thanks, Melissa, for the great intro and uh, great welcome. It's so, so great to be back here, back in person, uh, to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces as we uh, you know, kick off Q4i. For those who don't know, this is actually our fourth uh, Quantum Conference. We rebranded it this year. Team put a lot of effort, came up with Q4i, Quantum for International. And it really, I think, you know, sums up what we started back in 2019. Many of you were at our first workshop at SUNY Poly that we, we had hosted, brought in a lot of international partners, and we planned then to just keep it rolling. And then obviously 2020 hit, and we had to rethink and rebrand as to what we were doing. We ended up going with a competition, uh, Quantum Tech Accelerator. We were talking about that at dinner last night, and that, you know, that really pushed out some new partners, pushed out awards and grants to some people we hadn't worked with before, so that was a great success. And then last year, we really focused in on STEM and how to partner with AFRL. So, this year, as we thought through it, we really decided, you know, we got to hit it hard. We, we want folks here in this wonderful facility to be able to show it off and to, to get folks back together and to, uh, you know, talk quantum, if you will, talk quantum physics and really see, you know, where we can go uh, in this just amazing technology field. So as, as we get rolling here, uh, we'll get going. So Innovare, uh, we're gonna hear a lot about it over the next few days, but just to give you a little bit about what it is. So Innovare is a diverse community of government, industry, and academic organizations who are at the forefront of developing tomorrow's technologies in the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, cyber, quantum, and uh, UAS systems. By increasing our partnerships, developing new entrepreneurial ventures, and enhancing our community's intellectual leadership. Innovari is transforming and truly is transforming not only this area, but uh, certainly how we do business within the Air Force. And it certainly makes this a destination for our scientific and entrepreneurial talent from across the world to tackle our communities and our country's greatest challenges. Couldn't start this event without thanking our amazing team that all helped uh, to put this together. So certainly first and foremost, our hosts here, uh, the Griffiths Institute, NYSTEC, who's doing an amazing job as always, uh, getting this online, uh, AFOSR, and certainly this would not be possible without our team, our quantum team that you're gonna hear a lot from this week and see them and hopefully get a chance to go on the lab tours uh, from AFRL. And then of course, last but not least, we wouldn't be here today without uh, everyone who's presenting papers, uh, speaking, and especially a huge thank you for all our guests who traveled internationally as well as from far parts of the country to be here today. So what you're gonna hear uh, this morning in our first block of welcoming talks is what Innovari is all about in the Innovari Advancement Center. It really is about collaborations and it's about partnerships. And it really is you know, how we develop talent and how we accelerate technology. So we have some great community leaders with us today to uh, help kick things off. So first I'd like to introduce our county executive. Uh, Tony is a great colleague of ours. He's been a huge supporter of what we do at the lab and certainly at Innovare, we would not be here without his leadership, his foresight, and his vision. Uh, his partnership uh, coming with us with this building uh, is truly the reason we're here. So with that, Tony Pesante, United County Executive. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm so excited to see all of you here, as uh, as Mike said, in person, it's really exciting. As uh, you know, the last couple of years have been trying for everyone, and certainly uh, you know for all of you in this uh, you know in this endeavor. Uh, but uh, I want to welcome you here on behalf of Oneida County. Uh, certainly, you know those of you who have been here before uh, know what we have to offer and how, uh, how what a great community this is. Uh, I'm also joined, obviously, by my colleagues that you're going to hear from that uh, are. You know, I'm fortunate that uh, the 
the people here, uh, the, the leaders of this community are so invested uh, in something like this. And as, uh, as Deputy Director Haydick said, uh, this facility you know, was built in mind for all of this to, to capitalize and to expand and to grow you know, overall quantum and just all of our relationships with uh, the Air Force Research Lab. I want to thank Colonel Garcia, uh, the outstanding team that is assembled over at AFRL. The partnership between Oneida County, between the state of New York, and certainly, you know, our, our federal representative, uh, who you'll hear from shortly, Congresswoman Tenney, has been, you know, second to none. And, and we're proud of that. And we're proud of what has evolved uh, through the partnership with AFRL. You know, many years ago, the history of this, as so many other facilities around the country, uh, when, uh, you know, realignments and closures took place. Um, you know, this was an active SAC base, as everyone knows, but with uh, the Air Force Research Lab. You know, and as things closed and, and changed, uh, you know, the, the focus uh, certainly always, you know, the anchor has been the AFRL. And the partnership between, as I said, New York State, Oneida County, SUNY, uh, the Griffiths Institute, which evolved really as a part of what, you know, of what AFRL became and, 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 and became for all of us. So, you know, the, uh, the community leaders, myself, uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Izzo, Senator Griffo, uh, Congresswoman, uh, all, you know, come together, you know, in terms of, you know, making sure that this facility and that these these areas of, of expertise would be expanded upon and would be enhanced and would be able to host things like this. Innovari came up, you know, uh, over the last few years, uh, right before the pandemic, interestingly enough, and, and then was open during it, uh, which uh, it was a little sad, but then, uh, you know, we were able to open up and have uh, events such as these, uh, but, uh, and, and many more. You know, the idea was to have an open, uh, an open innovation campus uh, that uh, people from across the globe, uh, experts like yourself and in, this, in the field, could come and, and, and test and research and, and work hand in hand uh, with the Air Force Research Lab, with our uh, educational institutions, and certainly the Griffiths Institute as a leader in this. I want to thank Heather Hage, the, uh, the, the president and director of, of the GI uh, for all of her work in, in this. So, you know, the next few days as you're here, I hope you get an opportunity to venture out a little bit and see what the county has to offer. Um, certainly, you know, we, uh, we are proud of what we have, have, have built here. Uh, we are continuing to grow and so many of our projects continue moving forward, even with the pandemic. This is one indication of that. We never stopped. And I think that's, you know, that's a key piece when you look at the relationship with the Air Force Research Lab with uh, our partners uh, across, you know, across this spectrum that, you know, we continue to move forward. We're building a new uh, 600 million plus hospital in the city of Utica, state of the art. We're building uh, a new uh, addition to our arena, you know, for uh, with three more sheets of ice for, for hockey and soccer. We're building, uh, we just opened up Wolf Speed. Everyone's familiar with that, I think, in this in this group, in terms of the the uh, over a billion dollar uh, silicone carbide fab, uh, the first uh, the largest one in the world in the town of Marcy, just a few miles down the road. All of those things kept being built while we were going through this difficult time, and and really is a testament to our community. We're proud of that. So as as you as you expand as you work over the next couple of days, and and uh, certainly. Uh, I know you have a lot to do, but I hope, as I said, you have an opportunity to venture out, taste our, our great foods and restaurants, uh, you know, take a look at the great scenery that is uh, Oneida County and, and all we have to offer for, for tourism and, and other uh, activities. And uh, the hope is that uh, you come back and vacation here or, or, or even, you know, even move here. We're, we're, we're always looking for more residents and certainly uh, that is, is a key piece. So again, uh, enjoy your next couple of days. Thank you for most importantly for being here. It really says a lot about what we're trying to do in partnership with AFRL, with, our, with the GI, with, the, you know, with our institutions, SUNY and, 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 uh, and the state and, and all of our partnerships. So uh, welcome uh, again, thank you for being here. Enjoy the next couple of days and don't be strangers.
God bless. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, you know, as he just mentioned, certainly being able to transform this region, this area is, is what we've seen over the last 20 years. And, and he spoke to you know, Griffiths, where you, we're sitting right now. This used to be an active SAC base, so Strategic Air Command base. And when it closed down, it, it was pretty bleak here, but we had great leaders in the area uh, you know, from many years ago, really taking us to, to where we are today. And with that, you know, the, we wouldn't be here as well. And what you'll see around Griffiths now is this amazing transformation. So Rome, New York is, is truly become a very vibrant place with incredible assets. It's a wonderful place to live, to work, to raise a family. And the vision behind all of this since 2016 has been the mayor of the city of Rome, uh, who's again, a great colleague, always there for the lab and just an amazing supporter. We're so honored to have her here today, Mayor Jacqueline Izzo. Morning. We're so pleased to have all of you here in person. Uh, we thank all of you that did join virtually. You know, we, uh, as the county executive said, we're so proud of this facility. We're glad that you're here this morning to be able to see it and experience it for yourselves now the next three days. And we do hope that you look around this former Air Force base because it's no longer just a base with some installations. This is really being transformed as part of our community. We're marrying the, the business park with the city. We're building a lot of housing. The apartments that you see, uh, we've kind of created an urban setting. Those are 100% occupied. The minute a building opens, the apartments are full. We're building single family housing just down the street. So we encourage any of you that are thinking about wanting to be part of this here in Rome, please do so because we're transforming this community we want you to locate your businesses here. We want you to come here to Innovari and spend time. If you want to be here for a day <clears throat> or a couple of days or three weeks, a month, we're happy to have you. Please uh, take, take ch uh, charge of this facility while you're here. This is what it's here for, the collaboration that happens here with the AFRL. We're so proud, too, that we are the lab that is actually hitting all four quadrants of the 2030 strategy. And Quantum, we're the leader, we're at the top of that, and we're pleased to be there representing the Air Force and Space Force. And so we hope that the research that happens here and what you learn, you'll be able to take back to your businesses or your, your government facilities and implement those. Thank you to all our partners. The Congresswoman will be here soon. We have, uh, really upped our game the last several years with plus ups in the budget. We're proud of that as well. And that's a lot of that is due to the Congresswoman's uh, steadfast efforts. The county executive, this facility would not be here unless the county uh, really committed funding, which they did, multi-millions of dollars to build this. And so here we are, our ACE students are here also with us all summer. And they're able to be here now instead of in the lab, which is so very important. So many more things can go on in this facility. So welcome to Rome. We are having the World Series of Bocce, which uh, <laughs> it's a very unique Italian lawn bowling game. Uh, we have teams coming from all over the country. Uh, that, that kicks off on Thursday. So if anyone is still around, Head down to East Dominic Street. You'll have the best sausage and pepper sandwich you ever had and some pizza free. And we, we really encourage you to take part in our community. Hopefully I'll see a lot of you again on Thursday, but best of luck with the conference for the rest of this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Izzo. And yes, I'm not quite sure. Is it bocce? Is it bocce? I'm not sure. I grew up Polish here, so. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's been amazing. So we talked about our county partnership, uh, Mayor Izzo. Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, a key partner for us from New York State. Uh, New York State Senator Joe Griffo. He's been representing uh, the 47th District since 2007. He has a long history here in the county as county executive, as well as uh, mayor of the city of Rome, uh, previous positions. 
Senator Griffo uh, has served in many uh, positions within the state, including Deputy Minority Leader and is Chairman of the State Energy and Telecommunication, Telecommunications Committee. Again, a strong supporter of the lab and a great partner for us. Senator Griffo. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today. And uh, get your pads out right now or your phones, and I'll give you the mayor's phone number in case anybody gets in trouble. <laughs> She'd love you to call her at any hour of the day okay, or, or evening, right, Mayor? Uh, this is the uh, World Series of Bocce Weekend, as she said, and it's kind of funny when you look at the, uh, uh, the Q4I, and I said uh, this is also the home of the Commissioner of Baseball, uh, Rob Manford, so uh, we'd like to call this the Grand Slam of your <laughs> workshops here this year, and uh, it's, it's really an opportunity to to experience all that this community has to offer. And I think it's gonna be a great, exciting uh, workshop. Uh, right, Colonel Garcia? Everything's gonna be fine. And uh, boy, the logo is amazing. I think the Ophthalmology Society could use that as a new eye chart. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can help us with that. But it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today because uh, institutions like you're being involved with here, whether it's AFRL, the Griffiths Institute, NYSTEC, these are all leaders in, uh, in conducting cutting edge research. And I think that's what this is all about. And there's a real opportunity for you all to come together and to collaborate. Uh, and when you see this development in quantum technology, it's important because it not only is important to the national defense, but also to the economic development activities across the state and across our nation. So we're gonna witness innovation, advancement, development, uh, and discoveries because of this kind of collaboration. And we've assembled very talented and bright minds here. And I think that's what's exciting for me. You've all come together with the goal of developing and uh, expanding upon these technologies and pushing us all forward as a, a state and nation. Uh, so this workshop is gonna be an excellent illustration of that opportunity and that ability that you all possess. So uh, you're gonna be hearing from top tier researchers, industry executives, higher education and academia uh, will be present today. And I think there'll be a lot of exciting research topics related to quantum uh, and also a lot of networking and that opportunity I think is gonna be very beneficial to all of you. So I hope that you will continue to use that partnership and that collaboration to partner together uh, to develop new relationships and friendships and as a result of that, to inspire and, and create more opportunities in this great uh, technology that I think will be so beneficial to all of us uh, here, as I said, in our community and across the state, but also across this nation. So welcome to Rome, have a great experience. Uh, and again, if you have a problem at any time, day or night, uh, here's the mayor's number, you ready? <laughs> Thank you, bye. Uh, thank you, Senator Griffo. So it's very special. Uh, it's not too often we can have a sitting member of Congress join us here in person. Uh, Ms. Tenney has been an amazing partner to the lab. Senator Griffo alluded to it. So we have certainly the facility here, but the facility would only be kind of bricks and mortar if we didn't have our quantum team and the equipment that went along with it and the, the new laboratories that we were able to build. And part of that was due to uh, Congresswoman Tenney's efforts in uh, securing funding for the lab uh, that allowed us to develop those uh, capabilities as well as to reach our partners, many of which are here today that we wouldn't be able to do uh, without her. So uh, Congresswoman Tenney currently represents uh, uh, the district that we're in right now. Uh, she's been in portions of the 24th district for six years, uh, 22nd district as well as the 24th assembly district. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to be losing her because of changes in New York State and reconfiguration, so she won't be representing Rome uh, any further. But it's uh, very comforting to us to know that uh, she'll be very close. She'll still, still be fighting for the lab, for the DOD, uh, and for the Air Force uh, going forward. So it's an honor to have uh, Claudia Tenney with us today. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. I brought my cheat sheet because I'm not an engineer or a, phys a physics major. Thank you, Colonel. You always do such a wonderful job. And I just, I do want to say that not only do they have great sausage and pepper sandwiches, great bocce, they also have beer. So we have a lot of local varieties. And uh, actually, we have a, a tremendous, Rome is a tremendous community. 
And I have to credit the county executive, the senator, and especially Mayor Izzo for all that you've done to really bring uh, Rome back to life. As you can see, when you drive around Rome, we have a lot of great history. You go through Fort Stanwix, we have some of the oldest industries, we had the Erie Canal started here, and now we have the latest and greatest and the best technology in the world right here between AFRL, what's happening here at Innovari, and this entire ecosystem around this region, which is why we all work so hard in government to make sure that we continue to grow this region because Rome is really a jewel and all that you guys do, it's, we're, we're just so excited to have you and, and, and your aggressiveness and also our, our, our partners in government what you do to bring uh, this area alive. And yes, we would love to have you relocate here. Part of the reason we work so hard, and especially me as a lifelong resident of Oneida County, uh, said to leave here, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I have sort of a selfish interest, my son actually is a Naval Academy graduate and uh, just got out of active duty in the Marines and uh, worked in AI and worked in a number, a number of um, issues. He was like, I, I mean, by the way, I'm not a nerd. I, another county executive told me he didn't do well in physics. Um, I won't tell you what grade he told me he got, but uh, I was always good at math. It just wasn't something I did. And uh, my son, uh, one of the things, I, the, more, the better you all do here, the more I might be able to talk him into moving back to upstate New York. And uh, this is the place to go. And uh, we're just really excited to have uh, the opportunity to continue. And I just wanted to let you all know that anyone at the AFRL and all of you for coming here. And we do have, uh, this is NDAA week, National Defense Authorization Act week this week and next. So we'll be fighting to make sure that we keep uh, the great resources that we have here and to add some more. So far, everything we've asked for has been met, and I know that's going to be good news for all of you. So we want to make sure that all of you come back for a bigger and even better fifth annual event uh, here in Innovari. So I just want to say thank you again to all of you. Hope you have a great experience here, uh, that you learn a lot, that you continue to innovate, and you continue to be our leaders for our nation. In a, in a world where we need the type of work that you're doing, the research needs to be invested in. And we're just grateful to you for your, using your minds, giving us your talent and your ability to, to really grow this region and to grow in this uh, arena for our country and for our future. And so we're just grateful to you, but thank you to everyone. Uh, this is really an honor to represent this region. It's always in my heart, Michaels. I'm not, I'm not really leaving. I'm just going down the street six miles. So uh, anyway, I uh, would uh, love to hear from any of you if you have any requests. I will certainly get back to you and let you know how NDAA week goes. Uh, I'm sure it will be good. We're trying to stay under the radar to make sure our defense uh, uh, money and our defense uh, appropriations and all of our defense assets are not only preserved, protected, but grown in a way that we've been able to use. And I think this is important. A lot of taxpayers worry about spending. We do such a good job uh, with not just innovation and efficiency, but also in making sure what we're doing has, pays it forward. We're gonna be the leaders for the future and it's all gonna be right here in Rome. So you guys are in an historic place, not just back you know, to uh, Fort Stanwix, but also uh, what's happening here at Innovari and around our country. So thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and keep, the, keep up the good work. Hope you have some fun. Uh, if I get time to come back, I'll see you at the bocce tournament. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Tenney. Uh, it's great, great to have her here. Uh, Thursday, we'll be doing lab tours uh, right at the conclusion. So we're going to end up with sign-up sheets, so folks will be able to sign up and hopefully get to see the, the great facilities that we've set up right downstairs uh, in this building. So now we'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit, and we'll be calling up uh, our director of the AFRL Information Directorate, Colonel Fred Garcia, who is also the commander of the detachment four here at the lab. So he oversees not only the technical part of our directorate, but the installation as well. So it's, it's a huge job. It's an honor to work for him as his deputy. So in his role, Colonel Garcia oversees a staff of about 1200 government, military, uh, and contractors uh, performing work. Uh, today we're talking about quantum and this week quantum, but we cut across what we call uh, you know the information technology span. So. Uh, where we really brand it C4I and cyber. So command, control, communication, computers, intelligence, and cyber. So it's it's a huge job. Uh, we execute a, a budget of over $1.5 billion each year, not just solely in-house, but certainly with our partners across the nation, as well as across the world, uh, spanning uh, from basic research like quantum all the way to uh, you know, being able to deploy technologies in support of the warfighter right now. 
Colonel Garcia has been a great addition to us. He's been in Rome uh, just over a year. Uh, he, he's had just a long storied uh, career, uh, served in many capacities uh, throughout the Air Force, uh, including a nuclear uh, mission, uh, as well as a mission support group in his uh, past job. Distinguished academic career as well, a great November riddle, as well as the Air Force Institute of Technology and the Naval uh, War College as well. So with that, Colonel Fred Garcia. Well, I did my uh, engineering master's over 20 years ago, so I have to have a cheat sheet too because I can't remember how to do algebra. And so one of the things, and you heard it, so I have to follow some really great speakers, some really great people, and I thought, how do you do that? I'm sitting there thinking, oh, we got all these great people talking, and they're, they're going to tell you all the important things. Well, I'm nothing to this lab. Mike's everything to this lab. Dr. Waisaki, all the people that actually work here, they're the glue that actually holds this place together. I'm just the guy that Dean sends to jail when we do something illegal, and he's like, <laughs> But it's amazing to actually see this. And so I tell people a story a lot where I've been a lot of different places, kind of like Mike said, and we've always tried to get this collaboration, this partnership to actually work. And so before I got here, uh, Colonel Lawrence, the guy that I replaced, was telling me, we have all this stuff going. I said, yeah, right. And I didn't tell him this bit in my head. I'm thinking, yeah, right. That's stupid. That's never going to work. I've seen it a million times. It never works. And I got here and I think, wait, I think it's working. And then I got here and stayed a little bit more. And I said, Dude, this, this is working. And you know why it's working? It's because of the the great partnerships and the great people from the city, the county, the state, the national representatives, all the folks that you just heard talk this morning, they have sincere and huge dedication to making all this work. And you see this facility here in Navarre, it's perfect, it's beautiful, and it's actually open and it's full to capacity. Where's Heather at? She knows. Um, we've got so many folks doing so many great things here. But just another quick anecdote that I, I'll tell before I got here, they said, you're going to Rome, and I thought, I have no idea. Never been in AFRL before, done a lot of science stuff, but it's all on the strategic nuclear side of things and all that kind of thing. And so I got here and I said, Mike, I'm hearing all this quantum stuff. We got quantum financial system and the quantum internet. And we got quantum everything. And I said, finally, I can figure out, is this actually true? Because I think most of these people that are telling me these stories or you're hearing it on a podcast or something, you're hearing quantum everywhere. And I think, hmm, how much of that is true? And he said, well, let me tell you. <laughs> and so we're going to hear more about the rest of the story for you guys today. And so... Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone to the AFRL Information Directorate and to the Innovari Advancement Center. Especially, I'd like to welcome those who traveled the great distances to come here today around the world to be with us this week, as well as our U.S. government partners and our keynote speakers. A lot of good folks are going to speak today. Your presence adds so much to this workshop. Like Mike said, the mission of the Information Directorate is really huge, and I was just overwhelmed when I got here. I had two weeks of indoctrination of, hey, here's what we do here, two weeks, two long weeks. Like, every day is a long day, and I only seen like a small fraction. I thought, okay, man, I got to, how, how can one person actually do that? Well, it's because of the people, and they do that. But if I was to sum up what we do here in Rome in military terms, it's kind of like what Mike said, it would be Rome equals C4I and cyber. Uh, that is to say, command control, communications, intelligence, and cyber and computers. The information technologies that we are developing for the Air Force and the Space Force are in huge demand, as you guys all, all kind of know. These technologies cut across all facets of what these services need. This is really evident in the strong partnerships that we have across the DOD, the U.S. government, industry, academia, and also internationally. I was really surprised at all the partnerships that we have, and I thought, okay, typically it's this, this, and this. Well, in Rome, it's this, 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 this. And you go 365, and you got to do that about three or four times in order to actually catch all the different partnerships that we're doing here. Our technologies span all the way from supporting warfighter in the field today to very basic foundational technologies, including machine learning, advanced computing, networking, and, of course, quantum. The reason that you guys are all here today, which I'm eager to learn because I'm still hearing all that hype in the background. And most of these people have no idea what they do. So you guys hold the truth and the power and the keys to the future of the world right here in this room. And nobody's smiling. There's a few people smiling. The Air Force has long recognized the importance of quantum information science. In addition to Rome, AFRL has work occurring in several other locations spanning all aspects of what quantum is and what quantum does. Here in Rome, though, we focus on networking and computing. This week, you will hear about these technologies. We know that developing quantum means long lead time frames, but I can say that AFRL is committed for the long haul and committed to see these technologies become a sincere reality. And I see that every day when I'm walking the halls of the lab across the street over there. 
And then when you come over here and see what we've got down here in the basement at Inabari, it's huge. Things are really rolling. So one last thing I want to reiterate is the partnerships. Rome is all about partnerships. Every time I give an overview briefing and I show the partnership slide, and it's just huge. There's no room on our slide, and even our black room slide that spans four traditional screens. You can't fit all the partnerships on there. Our quantum team is a great example of these partnerships. I encourage you this week to talk to all members of our quantum team to see if there's mutual interest in partnering. We truly recognize that we can't go it alone and that it will take a whole of nation approach to make quantum information science practical and have an impact for both the commercial sector and for DOD. Congresswoman Taney kind of mentioned that earlier today that it really is a true whole of government approach that we have to take to this, but not just our government, it's governments across the world. Cities across the world, labs across the country, all kinds of things. Just think of a spider web and then put probably 100 more spiders in that spider web, create a more complicated spider web, and that's kind of a picture of partnerships that we're talking about here. So again, welcome to Q4i. I hope that you guys get everything out of it that our fine folks before me said, because you truly will. Uh, and then you're just going to want to come back for more. Thanks, Mike. All right, next up, uh, two speakers, uh, just a huge uh, special treat for us uh, to have with us today. So first up is Dr. John Burke. Uh, Dr. Burke joined the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering for Science and Technology as the Principal Director for Quantum Science in March 2022. In this role, Dr. Burke is responsible for leading the Department of Defense's strategy for quantum science, certainly one of the DOD's top technology areas. Prior to joining OSD, Dr. Burke served at DARPA as a program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office, MTO, as well as DSO, which is the Defense Sciences Office. Uh, he was in that role from 2017 to 2022. Uh, at DARPA, he managed a whole slew of programs developing quantum science and technology uh, across the wide swath uh, of those technologies. And before that, John was actually part of AFRL and our Space Vehicles Directorate down at uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. So we've known John a long time and it's great to continue to work with him uh, in his new role. And we're really looking forward to We had a great uh, discussion yesterday on his tour of the lab. So we're, we're really excited to have him in this new role and glad that he's able to join us here today. Thank you all and thanks for the invitation up here. What a wonderful facility this is. I, I got a little sneak peek yesterday, so you'll have to wait till Thursday, it sounds, but it's, a, it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, so, oh, went the wrong way. So, uh, uh, when I was asked to come up here, I was excited because I, A, I haven't been to Rome in quite a while, and uh, I, I knew that there was a lot of activity up here, uh, but also uh, it's a a bit of a, a, a history, I think, associated with, with quantum and the DOD that really, comes to a nexus here in Rome. So I wanted to kind of take the, the opportunity to kind of focus on that a little bit. So let's see here. So one thing we, we, uh, we looked at is, uh, uh, is thinking about the fundamental research that has, has gone on in the Department of Defense, and particularly in the Air Force. So you probably can't read all the, the, the labels here, but uh, that is every MURI program, multi-university research initiative program, put, to bar put together by the Department of Defense, going back 30 years, back to the early 90s. The bulk of that, the, and the top side of this, is all quantum information science uh, developments for computing or networking. And of those, the uh, AFOSR, the Air Force, part of AFRL now, uh, led 22 of 35 of those. So in particular, in the Air Force, uh, Fundamental research in quantum has probably been an important part of how we even are at this point today with this much enthusiasm, all of you gathered in this room and this exciting facility. It's just worth remembering, I think, that the role, A, of fundamental research, which maybe doesn't quite get quite the recognition it deserves, has led us to this amazing point, uh, where, and this inflection point that we're, we're enjoying today. Now, as, uh, let's see here. As, as, as Mike said, I'm from DARPA, so I can't help but also show a little bit of the DARPA history. When I was there, I was uh, looking back uh, for some reporting. We put together this timeline of all the DARPA programs related to quantum science going back, again, 30 years, or nearly so. 
So uh, a lot of these are quantum sensing programs I'm not going to talk about, but you see all the ones that mostly at the top in light green, those are all quantum computing and quantum information science related programs. In fact, I have a, a feeling if we surveyed the room, we'd find out that uh, between the MURI programs and these programs, everyone probably has been funded uh, at some point by these programs, including me, by the way, I, my graduate degree was back in one of the early programs uh, funded by DARPA. So it's, it's, a, it's an exciting uh, uh, history and, and uh, you know, I wanna say, you might notice a little gap here in the 2015 area, and there's a whole story behind that I'm not gonna get into. But there's one missing piece of this that's particularly important here. So you, really the even reason I had charts is I had an excuse to have this one picture. But uh, so this is uh, uh, Paul Alsing, who I don't think is here today, but uh, is one of, the, one of the main researchers in the quantum effort here in Rome that was hired, I think, early on in the, in the 2000s. Uh, this is Paul and I in 2015 receiving the sort of publisher's clearinghouse style check from the Department of Defense uh, for $45 million. And I went to all the services, but the Air Force got a pretty good chunk of it, and a lot of that came here. Uh, I know Kathy Ann, uh, one of the other uh, important researchers here, came on right about that time. We were just talking about this. This program, the Quantum Science and Engineering program, uh, really, I think, was an inflection point. A, uh, it was a point where big DOD, the fourth estate, really got involved and said, you know what, this is becoming really important, let's really invest in this. And the investment was mainly, mainly driven towards you know, hiring staff, getting staffed up, and equipment. And a lot of the activity here, I think, kind of traces its, back, its roots back to. And now it's become a, a, an exciting enterprise with uh, you know, congressional support, obviously, and uh, community support, and it's just really exciting to see sort of the, uh, the return on investment, if you, if you will, on all of that. Um, I'll also say that, uh, you know, because of all of that investment, we're kind of at an exciting point where we have uh, a lot of things we could go w work on. So uh, as a principal director of quantum science, I have a responsibility to kind of prioritize and, and strategize how we're going to deal, deal with all of these different ideas. And this is even a small slice of this. Uh, so this is a chart kind of trying to show imagined impact of quantum technology, and there's no numbers, this is sort of a qualitative chart, obviously, versus the, the readiness of some of these, of these devices. So I, I came from more of a quantum sensing background, so, but I'm not gonna talk about that today, although I will point out, for because we're on a little bit of history bent, it's worth remembering that the GPS atomic clocks, which run GPS, are one of the most important technologies we have in the Department of Defense, maybe in the world, and so it's important to remember that quantum has already had a massive impact, even if quantum computing still a ways off. So, but I wanna talk about going to this uh, full-scale quantum computer on the left, that's the kind of the exciting thing, and the networking we may need to actually get there, which is sort of roughly indicated by this dotted line. So it's early days, we don't really know uh, what the impact of these systems are gonna be, and so this, these bubbles, which are trying to indicate some uncertainty here, we could debate about any of these, bu these, these bubbles where they should go. Uh, but it's clear that um, the impact is potentially very important. In fact, you could argue that quantum computing, uh, even though we don't have one uh, that we're, we're really using uh, to an advantage, is already having an impact because we're already changing out all of our crypto just to, to, to deal with the possibility that we might have one. So uh, with, with that in mind, I want to kind of talk about the path forward a little bit. So quantum computing and quantum information science is, a, is, is tricky business and it's quite hard to, to, to think through how, I get to ask this all the time, I'm sure you will do, how long is it gonna take before we have one? Well, I don't have the answer for that, but I will tell you that there's a lot we need to work on. So I think it's starting to, to the point we need to get serious about this and really start thinking about how we're really gonna push forward, graduate from fundamental research and move into really engineering these kind of systems. So, we're kind of on the left here uh, in terms of number of, uh, of qubits, you know, maybe uh, order 100 qubits. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm not sure qubit number is the right metric, but it's a, it's, it's a useful one, so we're gonna use it. So we're kind of down here thinking about uh, small uh, systems and how they might stitch together and sort of the architectures of these things. But we need to graduate pretty soon to certain thinking about architectures that fully scale, so logical-based systems, and that's gonna be a bit of time just trying to sort that out. But then it gets, starts, getting, uh, starts getting hard. We start to think about actual engineering. So this is a, a picture from, uh, uh, from, from one of Google's computers, and I just wanna point out all of the wiring there. 
So we all know that an input output problem is looming. We need to figure out how we're gonna deal with all of this control hardware uh, and actually do it at, in this case, at the right temperature. So that's one hard problem we've got to solve. This sort of implies a 3D integration uh, problem is looming as well. And so, you know, in, in classical electronics, 3D integration is sort of new on the scale of things. We're going to have to reinvent that sort of philosophy for this system. So there's a picture from IBM's website kind of indicating some, some notion of this. Uh, MIT Lincoln Lab's got a concept from, from one of their papers you can see. So we're starting to think about this, but this is going to be a, a pretty in important engineering exercise just to sort this out. And now that's not going to get us to the maybe millions of, or tens of millions of qubits, depending on who you ask, that you, you, we might need. Uh, so we need to think about things like yield. Uh, and, and these very complex systems in classical space, yield has gotten to be bad enough that people are talking about using like chiplets and backplanes and things like this. I, we have no idea, I have no idea at least, about how you would do that for a quantum system. So we're going to have to invent uh, the means by which to deal with this, or at least some other mechanism to get around any yield problems that come along. And finally, I want to talk about, uh, I think, maybe the most important thing on this chart, at least, and probably the most relevant thing for, for, for here. Even if we figure all of that out, we need to find that way probably to make a modular system, which means we probably need a quantum network of some kind. So you look at you know, modern day uh, you know, information systems, uh, high performance computing systems, and they're modular. And you see all this Ethernet cable, or these days you can actually see fiber connections between a lot of these things. So we had to invent all the means by which we're gonna parallelize a bunch of these quantum processors together. Uh, and so we don't know how to do that. And fortunately, AFRL Rome is, is ahead of the curve here and trying to sort that out. Uh, there's a lot of potential uh, uh, use cases or, or sorry, uh, potential uh, mechanisms that, that you could use. Depends on the qubits, maybe many qubits have to be stitched together. But I think this is gonna be one of the most important problems we have to solve in sort of the roughly near term in terms of actually building some kind of system. So uh, it's, it's good to see, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the past looking, for, looking you know, backwards in time and how we got here and how important AFRL Rome uh, RI is in the whole, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem, especially in the DoD. I think I happen to know that AFRL Rome is, I think, the, 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 the pointy end of the spear, the, the biggest uh, center uh, in terms of quantum in the department. Uh, and it's also important to see that they're thinking way ahead uh, of the, the really hard problems that are coming down the, the pipe and getting ahead of that now. So that's exciting to see. And uh, um, yeah, I'm just, just want to reiterate, I'm excited to see that they're, they're not only are pushing towards the, 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 uh, the important things in the future, but also have this great facility and the great partnerships that they're putting together to actually make sure we can get there because it's gonna be a bit of a haul to get there, I think. That's all I have for today. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. I know he's on a very tight time schedule, so we're glad we're able to uh, make it all work for his schedule today. So we're truly honored. So as mentioned earlier, you know, we kind of started where we are here in Rome, uh, moving up to the Department of Defense, and now the whole of nation approach. So we're so honored today to have Dr. Charlie Tahan with us. So Dr. Tahan is the Assistant Director for Quantum Information Science and the Director of the National Quantum Coordination Office within the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where he is on detail from NSA's Laboratory for Physical Sciences. In addition, he is continuing to serve as LPS's Chief Scientist and as Director of the LPS Qubit Collaboratory. Previously, Dr. Tahan was with Booz Allen Hamilton, where he served as Chief Technical Consultant for Quantum Information Science and Technology Programs at DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office. Please joining me in welcoming Dr. Charlie Tahan. All right, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, it's really an honor to be here. I've heard AFRL's name mentioned over the years, and I, this is the first time I've been here. It's really, it's really a pleasure. Um, you've built something really special, right? This building, you know, the, the team. I have hired many quantum computing people, quantum technology professionals in my career. You've hired some amazing people, and that's really the hardest part. It's not the building, <laughs> it's not the facilities, it's the people. And coming here and seeing the kids coming in and out, you know, I, before I even walked in, I knew it was going to be a special place, right? Because um, we have a real issue in our country with STEM education and having enough people to staff even the jobs we have now, let alone what we'll have in 10 years. 
So, I mean, that's really a, a, a key need for the future. Okay, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about um, what's going on in the White House and across the interagency and the National Quantum Initiative. I'd like to start off with just a reminder of how the federal government works. We have <laughs> so I hope you have another three hours. Um, we have a very federal system for science funding, right? Congress, president, the agencies all work together and kind of argue with each other to figure out how to make that happen. And then even with the science funding agencies, each has their own mission and system of providing funding. The DOD, if you just heard from John, is a, is a whole world in and of itself with many different um, agencies with their own models from DARPA to AFOSR um, and, and so on. That's a robust system, but it's a system that needs coordination. And, and one way that that happens is through the Office of Science Technology Policy, National Security Council, Office of Management and Budget, all in the Executive Office of the President. In the National Quantum Initiative, Congress recognized this and created a subcommittee on quantum information science, uh, which is co-chaired by DOE, NIST, and NSF. Just this last year in the NDAA, they legislated another subcommittee, the Subcommittee on Economic and Security Implications of Quantum, which is co-chaired by NSA, DOD, and DOE again. And just gives, we have two subcommittees on quantum in the White House. This gives you a sense of how important this topic is as a critical and emerging technology. The NQI Act also created in my office the National Quantum Coordination Office, only one of a few coordination offices in the White House sitting in OSTP. And it's really quite special because we have government detailees from really the, the, the big funders of, of quantum funding in the US, DOD, NIST, NSF, DOE, and NSA. So we have government detailees at the White House coordinating across all the agencies. So um, quantum is quite a hot topic, has been for a while. We have 14, 15 agencies who actively participate in our, in our committees, and this is how we basically coordinate. Another thing Congress asked us to do is write together, write a strategy for the national program in quantum information science. And we, re we released a uh, first cut at this back in 2018, which outlined six high-level policy uh, uh, goals for the NQI, from science to workforce, building an infrastructure, um, balancing the economic and security implications of quantum science, um, and continuing to co cooperate internationally while building our industry here in the U.S. as quantum technologies really become uh, available and realizable. And over the last few years, the budget for quantum has doubled, you know, due to this increased attention and efforts, you know, across the agencies to really move quantum forward. And I'll just say, if you're interested in what's going on, um, you can go to quantum.gov. We've been amending this um, strategy. Really, all the agencies are writing additions to this um, around specific topic areas. So let me just start with um, science. So we just had to summarize, you know, our approach. It's three things: getting the science right, enhancing U.S. competitiveness, and um, enabling our people. So getting the science right is first. You know, we're still early in this technology. We don't know all the applications. There are still many technical roadblocks to realizing even what we know is possible. And so, you know, tackling those hard problems first um, is the first message we want to get across. And this we got across in the Quantum Frontiers Report, which really lists, here are the top eight technical areas we really need to focus on as a nation. And within those, you can find the grand challenge technical problems like understanding correlated errors in a fault-tolerant quantum computer or um, you know, precision navigation and timekeeping and so on. So that's the Quantum Frontiers Report. And since then, we released two additional reports on quantum networking and quantum sensing, which really are a result of the agencies coming together and fighting. <laughs> like, so there, there are disagreements, for example, about quantum networking. You know, should we be invest, investing in quantum key distribution? So we'd be building a quantum network. And it was really important to tackle that first, because in some sense, that's the most immature technology. You know, we don't know the applications of a large scale distributed quantum entanglement network. Why, we don't know enough to invest very large amounts of money. Right? We do know, and this is what's captured in the report, that investing in the core components, 
high fidelity transducers for our memories is going to be valuable for multiple fields. We know that we need to build, you know, right sized quantum networks to understand those applications and so on. And that's captured here. And then quantum sensors, um, quite a different style where we already have, you know, atomic clocks or dependent on atomic clocks for GPS and other, other technologies. You know, there, because of its maturity, really what we need to do in the next five years is bring those from lab to market. You know, so if we want to show something a value for the NQI in its first, you know, five years, we need to start showing uses that will be relevant to society. Okay, so, um, and then the next is enhancing competitiveness. So within, um, what else, we have a subcommittee on, on economic security. Um, we have a quantum industry uh, consortium that was set up by NIST. The goal really here is to boost our industry, move as fast as possible, while figuring out ways to protect it, you know, for people who want to take our intellectual property or use these systems against us. So that's really the goal. There's been a lot of progress there, and I'll get to more about that later. And the third one is enabling our people. Um, as I said, if you list all the jobs available in quantum right now, there are a lot that we can't fill. And we, project, we expect that to continue to grow. So our workforce development strategy is critical. This is why one of the first things I did when I um, started the OSCP was help launch the Q12 Education Partnership, which is a partnership with companies, educational societies, the government, NSF, to try to bring curriculum, quantum curriculum to the K-12 level, you know, sort of age appropriate. Um, so there's a real opportunity there, I think, for AFRL to participate in that and to work towards, you know, making people quantum literate, but also capable of taking advantage of this new field. Also, I just want to point out, you know, the first report that came out of Essex, and that was in response to some concerns that happened a couple of years ago around closing off our um, kind of immigration for high, high quality talent from overseas. And to be sure, there, there are concerns about people who want to take advantage of this technology. But first and foremost, you know, the U.S. depends on being a welcoming place for talent. You know, so our, our if you look at our graduate, you know, um, programs, very large proportions are people who've immigrated. You know, my, my father was immigrants. Um, we need to continue that. Um, but we have to do it in a way that sort of is realistic of the world we're living in. So one of the things this report asked was that each funding agency in quantum think about technology protection, even the ones who don't typically want to, like NSF, um, just to think about you know, what they're funding, how it will affect um, the future of, of the country. Um, sort of in that vein, um, one of the first in-person uh, meetings, actually the first in-person meeting for OSCP in this administration uh, was an industry and society event for quantum. So we brought every quantum computing company we could fit into one room at the White House with the COVID rules at the time. And we had a discussion about the state of the field, you know, where private public partnerships could work and how we could move the field forward faster while protecting, you know, our industry. And that balance is going to be a very delicate one we're going to have to maintain over a long period of time, as John was mentioning, but also one that, you know, is critical to us maintaining U.S. leadership. So I have my own uh, figure, which is a little bit less dense than John's, and it just tries to portray, you know, where we are. We know that, for example, atomic clocks have been tremendously transformative for our technology base. We have a lot of evidence that large-scale quantum computers will be similarly disruptive. And then there's a lot of still open questions, and this comes back to this idea of, you know, hard science, solving the hard science problems first. You know, one of them being, what are the applications for a quantum computer? And, you know, one of the questions we ask companies and continue to ask, and I get asked all the time is, well, if you build one, <laughs> it's going to cost a lot of money to build and, and develop, you know, why would we do that? What's, what are the applications? We know we've worked a lot in cryptography, you know, because that was the first kind of killer app for a large scale quantum computer. So we have a good sense of the resource estimates needed to break our public key encryption we use today. That's got a lot of uh, ramifications. The other ones, you know, we're still learning. You know, we've done a lot of work in more recently on quantum chemistry applications, unclear what the economic you know, impact will be. 
This is part of the reason for the DARPA Farm Benchmarking Program, part of the reason we're so excited about it. Some of these other applications, again, are even more nascent. And one of the goals, you know, if I had a dream chart I'd like to have, you know, sometime in the near future, it would be, you know, what is our level of confidence for these algorithms as a function of the size of the machine you need? And so I've drawn a cartoon here, which is you know, no way trying to be accurate, but we know that cryptology has a very high impact. You know, we've done a lot of work on it, so we have a decent sense of how big a machine it is. Um, but the other ones, there's still a lot of work to do. So, I mean, I guess my message here is we need to find applications, we need to understand their research requirements, and for the DOD, what are those applications that will matter to the DOD? And how big a computer will it matter? You know, those are the things that are gonna justify more investment into this next phase of engineering. Um, I wanna end with um, a presidential directive. So the president actually signed two directives just this May, and that's qu quite rare. Um, one was on the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee, which uh, ex expressed a, uh, you know, a commitment to the NQI for the Biden-Harris administration. The second, to me, is really our, our first strategy for quantum computing, and that's NSN 10 on quantum computing. It had three goals. Many, many people just heard one, which was the second, which is let's prioritize the, the transition to post-quantum cryptography or cryptography, cryptographic systems that are resilient to a large-scale quantum computer. But the first one really was the promote aspect, that the U.S. has to continue to be a leader, and to do so, we need to invest in R&D, in infrastructure, workforce development. That is a national priority all the agencies have to support. The second is moving to PQC within a, a certain timeline, giving very specific responsibilities to certain agencies. And the third is figuring out how to do that while protecting our IP in the meantime. Because even successful transitions to cryptology in the past have taken at least 10 years. If you get it wrong, it takes forever. <laughs> so you really can't just assume that it's gonna be done. You really need to think carefully about what you're investing in in the meantime and into the future, both for our econom economy and for our national security. And just you know, really quickly, why um, did we do it? In, in the, Number one, you know, a krypton lytic scale quantum computer seems possible. We have not met yet any physics no-go that would prohibit it. We may reach that at some point, right? But we haven't seen it yet. Transitioning to new cryptographic systems takes a long time, even if you do it well. If someone else had a krypton quantum computer and they wanted to do us harm, they could steal a lot of information from U.S. companies and cause massive economic harm, in addition to all the national security harms. Um, and moving to PQC will not be easy. It will be expensive, it requires a lot of coordination. It's, it's really quite a complicated upgrade. Um, and then finally, you know, we need to, as we invest, we need to protect. So we have to both move fast and protect. And that requires sort of a new way of thinking, probably different from what we've done in the past. All right, so just in that vein, we're not going to do this alone. You know, working with our close minded allies. Um, and partners is critical. Quantum has always been a global field. We need to continue to make that. This is a multilateral meeting we had in the White House just last month or in May. We had 12 countries you know, who, who are investing significantly, have a national quantum strategy like we do, to start talking about these bilateral, multilateral things we can do to both make a PQC deployed across the world, um, but also how to protect and advance our technologies together. So I'll end there and just say, um, please visit quantum.gov, um, check out what we're doing. There's a lot of pending legislation that can have transformative impact on you know, infrastructure investments like the CHIPS Act, um, potentially you seek out the Endless Frontiers Act or whatever you're calling it. Um, new organizations like ARPA-H, which have an opportunity to spend a lot of money to do biomedical sensing based on quantum sensors. I think that's going to be a big opportunity. Technology director at NSF. There's a lot of things coming down the pike where we could have a lot of influence um, in the quantum field. All right, so um, please check out quantum.gov and happy to talk after. I'll be around today and tomorrow morning. We do have some time for some questions. Oh, sure. Is there any questions? Thank you for a great talk. 
I'm Heather Hage. I'm the president and CEO here at the Griffiths Institute. My question is about technology protection plans. Um, can you help describe for us a little better either what you believe are the features of an effective technology protection plan or point to anyone nationally who you believe is leading in developing innovative or at least effective technology protection plans for quantum? Thank you. This is a great question. Um, and in fact, uh, Congress gave us some homework <laughs> in the last NDAA in December asking us to do a research uh, assessment of research security across the agencies for both research security and for expert controls. So we have set up working groups um, across the energy agency just to answer this, to help each agency develop their own technology protection plans. I think it's, it sort of depends on your approach. Um, NIST actually has a quite a good uh, strategy for, they have a lot of uh, people coming from uh, you know, across the world working at their facilities. They think very carefully about how they allow access. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's just understanding the problem, right? Acknowledging that there are risks and that you need that what they could be and just framing everything you do in that respect. Not necessarily changing what you do, but just understanding it, right? So that's the first and foremost thing. And then second and third is, you know, gets into the details. But to me, like NIST, IARPA have very good models for how they manage, you know, completely open programs um, while not slowing them down, but just adding a layer of understanding and, um, you know, understanding of the potential for problems. I'm happy to talk more if you and point you to people. Who's one over there? Your slides were dense with information and they were very <laughs> well done. Um, I suspect if you go to quantum.gov, it's not as concise. Is there any way that you can share some of those slides? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm ha happy to share if you send me an email or I don't know if they'll post them. Thank you. Thank, uh, Dr. All right, next up will be our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, this keynote uh, talk will be given by Dr. John Sang Kim. Dr. Kim is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Physics and Computer Science at Duke University, where he has led many collaborative research and development projects at the frontier of foundational quantum computing technologies. Dr. Kim is also co-founder and chief technology officer of IonQ, founded commercialized trapped ion quantum computers. He has also previously been at Bell Labs and Lucent Technologies and is a fellow of the American Physical Society and Optica. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Sang Kim. Right. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hayduck and the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, come here and uh, present today. Let's see if I can get the direction to go. There you go. Um, um, it's great to be back here. Um, um, Dr. John Burke mentioned about the QSAP program that was started maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, when they put that, when the DOD, Depart uh, OSD, Office of uh, Secretary of Defense, put that program together, they also created what's called a TARP. Um, and that was uh, called the Technical Assessment and uh, Review Panel. It was a group of uh, uh, industry uh, and academic experts who um, was actually brought in to work with, uh, with the DOD labs. Um, I was asked to chair that um, panel and um, in that capacity we, we visited uh, Rome, we had a review meeting here. Uh, it was a great uh, to see the, the investment made by the DOD's leadership um, you know, bloom into what, what the activities are here today. Um, I, I would like to also um, feel honored to, to speak in front of many uh, community leaders, uh, DOD and the national leadership, and also uh, distinguished guests from many areas of our academic and industry communities. Uh, so I'll probably dive into um, you know, more of a technical side of the talk, but um, you know, I, I got into quantum about 30 years ago when I first came to the US to, to study um, graduate school. 
Um, it was before quantum computing really became a field, right? There were some very early notions of it. Um, um, I started my grad school in 92 and 94 is when uh, Shor algorithm came about. Um, but uh, in the, and therefore there was a long period of basic science that we all, all of us uh, invested our, our time and effort in. Um, just in the last maybe 10 years or so, I got much more interested in how these uh, fundamental science stimulates into um, uh, more of a academic, uh, more of an industry transition. So um, that's one area I wanted to um, focus on as I, as I go through my, my presentations. Uh, let's see. Um, it looks like I'm missing one slide just before this, <laughs> which I think was the was a critical uh, set aside before we get dive into the technical details. Um, but the the notion is, if you think about how science uh, transitions through engineering um, into actually a user uh, community, and you know that's how the if you look at the computing industry, uh, we can go all the way back to the 40s when people were building, you know, these uh, tr uh, vacuum tube based uh, gigantic computing machines. Um, and um, now I'm at the DOD, DOD uh, laboratory. I, I actually, when I was looking at that history, um, it looks like uh, you know World War II um, ended uh, on two fronts: one in, in, in Europe and another one in um, in the Pacific. And what really won the war was actually technological difference. It was really a technological advantage. Um, on the European side, um, you know, the the, uh, the Americans and the, and the and the British have come up with these. Um, uh, Computer, uh, computing machines that cracked uh, the crypto systems for Germany. And if you've seen the movie, um, uh, what's it called? Um, I Imitation Game, right? It actually shows the history of how uh, by cracking the code, they were able to overcome the, German, uh, the Germans in, in the war. And on the Pacific, as you all know, um, the, the real uh, technical differentiator was the atomic bomb. Right? So um, the, the largest conflict that we've been through um, in the past decade our past century uh, really ended because of a technological um, difference rather than, um, of course, you know, that, that translated to, to, to military uh, advances. Uh, so it's very interesting to note how big of an impact like new technology can have um, on, on some of these fronts. Uh, but at the same time, the same technology innovation, uh, invention of the transistors and the transition into the, um, the Moore's Law era, really created the economic advantage that really propelled some of the tech countries and econ economies that held that, that frontier of that technology to really drive um, the world's uh, leadership uh, over the past you know, half, a, half a century or so. So um, I feel like it's very important to learn from that experience and how does like, the scientific advances uh, frontier transition into um, Moore's Law, which, which drove the economy for, for many decades, um, and if you look at the Moore's Law from a technological point of view, it looks like, yeah, we're, we're doubling the density of transistors. It looks like a very technical uh, progress. Uh, but underlying uh, of that really is an economic scale. Economic scale means you, you build um, computers that can do very limited things, right? But that actually creates some real value, uh, whether it's to the government or the scientific community or whatever the, 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 uh, uh, the, the user is. And, and that gives you enough incentive to actually reinvest. To, to really push the technology forward. And when that happens, all of a sudden you have more uh, users, more application areas. And this actually virtual cycle keeps going, right? That's how we, as a society, we were able to invest trillions and trillions of dollars to really push the technology forward. So the key question is how do you actually get that economic cycle going? How do we make sure that we find first uh, applications, even if it's small niche applications, uh, so that we can actually start to reinvest. And when that kind of growth happens, it also sucks in the best talent, uh, the young talent into that industry. And really it's the, 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 the compounding effect of both economic impact and the excitement and the talent pool that really gets this kind of economic engine going. So I'd like to see, um, make sure that we're, we don't only focus on technology, but how that technology transitions to, to impact and today, of course, everybody uses computers. Um, even you know, three, four-year-olds will be looking at iPads and all that. Um, and when, when you look at these users, they really don't know what is the technology behind it, right? My, my, even my college-age kids, um, they, they don't really know how computer chips are built, but they all use it every single day, right? Um, middle school kids are sitting home and doing homework over internet using their computers. Uh, they barely know what's in the box and how it works, but it actually delivers the utility um, and that's what really builds um, into a, a real technology. So the key question is, how do we think about quantum from like a very basic science that we've been investing in the last 20, 30 years 
Um, and right now, I think there is that economic transition that is about, uh, I think, I think very likely to happen. And how do we actually make sure that that happens within within our control and and, and we lead that? Um, and then eventually get to a point where non-experts will be using these quantum computers to do very very useful things. So I think that's kind of um, uh, the focus. Uh, and if you look at the key aspect of that commercial transition, it's really about practical utility. Right? It's, it's less about quantum physics. It's about what can people do uh, with the technology that we create. And I think it's, it's very important to, to start to look at it from that angle. Um, now, when it comes to that, there are lots and lots of activities. right? I, I think this quantum, uh, quantum computing industry and quantum information science is very exciting because we all started from a, a basic science a community of uh, scientific researchers. So there's a common ground, we talk to each other, we are very open to communications. Uh, but then as, as, as you go to commercial, uh, there are many, many different opportunities that different groups of people uh, see. Um, and I think it's really great to see uh, some of these really passionate people uh, converge on kind of their vision and, and push it. Um, and um, you know, in some sense that creates uh, both collaboration and competition, which I think is extremely healthy. Um, and it's re really the, the role of government like Ch uh, Dr. Tehan and others to make sure that we have a complete spectrum. Um, but it's also really the individual efforts um, that are very focused that will really uh, create a, a technology push forward. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to start uh, talking about some of the opportunities I see into the transition from the basic science into the engineering and eventually to users um, who actually don't really necessarily have to know what's, what's in the box. Uh, that can, kind of uh, is where uh, we're headed into the, into the uh, opportunity into the future. Uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to start with uh, uh, physics a little bit. And I, uh, again, I'm going to get very deeply technical very quickly. Um, uh, it looks like, uh, I really feel like some of the, uh, the slides are missing. There is another slide in front of this. <laughs> um, somehow, um, yeah, I don't know what's going on. There, there, I think when I tested on the, on the slide, the, the slides were not missing. Um, but uh, basically, the, the first question from a scientific point of view is, you know, in order to build quantum computers, you have to have a good representation of the bits. And if you look at the classical world, um, eventually we, we started from like vacuum tubes representing a bit to all kinds of different devices, mechanical relays and things like that. And eventually we converged on this device called CMOS. And CMOS is a, a bunch of transistors in a very specific way that represents information. Um, and when it's uh, representing information, it doesn't dissipate any, any energy, but it's extremely efficient at uh, uh, transitioning and processing that information, right? So when, when you have a digital information processing, the best digital device turned out to be a trans uh, this CMOS transistor. That's where the technological scale happens. Um, so we, um, uh, from a scientific point of view, my question is, you know, what is a perfect qubit? A perfect qubit is where you have these two um, uh, quantum states, zero and one, and then you should be able to support the superposition of these two. Superposition means that there's some weight between the two, and then there's a phase between the two. That's like the two uh, aspects of the quantum. And if the weight um, is uh, retained forever, that's uh, that time constant over which the weight between zero and one is uh, retained in NMR language is called T1. And the relative phase uh, retained uh, is in NMR language is called T2. So an ideal qubit is where both T1 and T2 goes to infinity, in which case you can store the information in the qubit and will be stored for a very long time, forever. Right? Um, and from that perspective, um, it turns out that from a very fundamental physics point of view, um, the, the hyperfine ground states of an atom uh, happens to be a very ideal candidate for that because the, the T1 uh, is measured in, in, in terms of millennia, meaning thousands of years, uh, literally. Um, and T2, uh, which is kind of uh, represents the frequency difference between the two levels. Um, and actually that um, is that we actually define the reference of an atomic clock. And the, the actual absolute reference of a clock is based on an atomic hyperfine qubit, which means by definition, you know, that's like the perfect clock, right? And that clock actually retains the optical phase, uh, this, this phase relationship between the two qubit states. So um, based on the, the international standards, um, it turns out that if you want infinity T2, you just have to look at uh, the atomic clock that defines that frequency, right? And that is the hyperfine physics. And um, although it's a very relatively exotic system, um, it is actually really nice because the physics is very simple. It, it's an individual atom. Um, when you get the same species of the same isotope of the same atom, um, then they're all identical. Um, and that's why we picked them um, as these atomic uh, frequency standards. Um, so 
um, you know, there, there are some, this is actually an example of the atoms that we use. Uh, it's, it's, it's got, um, all of these atoms have a hyperfine ground state, and you can see that these numbers of many, many, many digits. And, uh, you know, you, you might as well pick this one as an absolute reference uh, compared to the cesium that we have picked um, uh, out of convenience uh, in the 70s. Um, and, and these are, are, are extremely accurate. So, so you can actually use this as, a, as an atomic reference, which means that the dephasing, uh, unless there are technical noise, can be made extremely long. Um, and then we have a very good way to initialize these things with an error in the 10 to minus 6 range. Uh, we can actually, oh, there, there it is. Um, I don't know, somehow it's, it's out of order. So what is a good criteria defining a perfect qubit? Um, it's, uh, it's the decay between the two and the energy spacing. Um, and as I said, um, the high fine ground states, uh, for if you go to hydrogen, uh, people calculate that to be about 11 million years is, is where the spontaneous emission uh, that, that changes that, that difference. And you know that, that gets a little bit worse as you go to heavier atoms, uh, but typically these are measured in, in thousands of years. Um, and then this frequency reference is what actually causes this dephasing. Um, and there, again, the, the absolute reference is this. This is an, an exact definition of what, what one second is. Um, and, uh, the, the, and therefore, the hyperfine ground state of atom, atom really gives you a good place to store um, information. That doesn't mean that our compu computer is perfect, but our memory can potentially be perfect if you eliminate all technical noise uh, in the system. Um, let's see. I don't know what else is out of order. Um, all right, so um, with this, you can, you can see that the, um, uh, the uh, T2 time, really, um, we, we, when we uh, go into the lab and trap an ion, we, we typically see about a second of coherence time. Um, but with some effort, just uh, you know, doing better and better technology, people have demonstrated uh, coherence times uh, in, in terms of hours. And again, it's, it's, it's purely limited by technology and not by any fundamental physics because we defined it, we defined it that way. Um, and then we can actually initialize these things with, uh, well, with I, I mentioned about uh, 10 to minus 6 fundamental errors. Um, and then we can actually do single qubit gates either by uh, driving that transition between these two uh, qubit levels with a microwave pulse, um, or uh, we can actually do that by um, driving it through uh, what we call the Raman transition. Um, I feel like my, my slides are all completely out of order. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but it's coming up in random order. So let me see if I can continue to keep the message. Um, and then we can actually do some two cubic gates by um, you know, moving these atoms uh, by laser fields. You can actually shake them a little bit. And because they are now charged, it, these are atomic ions, um, they feel Coulomb interaction. And that allows you to actually create entanglement between the, the atomic states. Um, so here, um, it shows an example of our uh, collaboration um, at, uh, at Duke University uh, with uh, Chris Monroe and Ken Brown. Um, at, uh, back then, Chris was at the University of Maryland. Um, and this is where we, we built a, quantum, a small, relatively small-sized quantum computer of about, uh, in this case, they, they uh, started with about 15 qubits in a quantum computer. And uh, we actually have an architecture where we can pick arbitrary pairs of ions in that system and then do this two qubit gates. And we can actually have a very, very flexible uh, circuit execution. Um, and based on that, we've actually they've implemented some very early versions of quantum error collection. Right? So, so um, and there are a lot of um, recent progress in quantum error correction theory um, that was made in the last maybe five years or so. Um, that actually provided more and more efficient ways uh, to, to encode information so that you can build a, a more robust qubit. Now, uh, we're still at a point where um, the, the individual gate fidelities um, for this specific code is actually not good enough. We need to improve it just a little bit more um, to, to see that actually error correction, applying error correction actually improves the quality of the, the gate operations. Um, you should note that uh, for for trapped ions, uh, for reasons I mentioned earlier, if you want to retain the quantum information for a long time, you really shouldn't be worrying about error correction. You should just be worrying about build, uh, taking systematic errors out of your system. Uh, but in order to actually do better gate operations, you actually have to make sure that some of these protocols are, are implemented. All right, so um, here you see that uh, in some of these operations, like single qubit uh, gate operations and uh, uh, state preparation and, and measurements, uh, we are actually making slight improvements over, um, over um, the, the two qubit gate fidelity that we operate. So basically, we're, we're, we're using uh, less perfect two qubit gates, uh, but can, can actually operate uh, slightly higher, better uh, spam and single qubit gate errors. 
Um, but if you look at the physical spam in single cubic gate errors, uh, they're actually pretty good. They're actually um, even better. <laughs> uh, so we still have some ways to go on making sure that we actually re really reach the fault tolerant regime uh, with any of these systems that are existing today. All right, so um, what this means is uh, there is um, on this, uh, we start from a, um, a really good uh, representation of a qubit. And we're actually building some systems and I'll get to um, in a little bit more into how we build these systems and what are the, some of the technological advances we're making. Um, but even at the basic science level, I think there is a plenty of room for, uh, for exploring some really fundamental science. Uh, so first of all, in our system, we're realizing that our errors are dominated by more systematic and control errors uh, until we hit some fundamental limits in the atomic physics level. And those things are, are extremely well understood uh, or actually much better understood than some of the other physical qubit systems that we have. Um, so uh, we, there is lots of room for innovating in uh, coherent control and error mitigation techniques. Um, and then uh, we can, once we understand what they are, we can actually uh, reflect them into building more robust hardware designs that, that uh, reduces or eliminates uh, some of these errors. Um, there is also, um, we can also come up with a lot of really interesting ideas in error cancellation at the circuit level. Uh, we can also create multi qubit entangling gates uh, there are some really nifty uh, crosstalk cancellation techniques and things like that that helps uh, operate your quantum computer much better, uh, mainly because all of these errors are dominated by system, uh, systematics and control. Um, and the real nice thing about that is once we build a system, we can do all of these things, all in software, without having to build a new hardware. Right? So I think we're getting to a point where we understand how to build a very robust and flexible uh, controlled systems um, and then do a lot of these protocol investigations in, in software. So there's lots of interest up and opportunities there. Um, and then um, we, we've also seen that these high performance gates can be maintained um, as the system goes from a single dozen to two dozen to about three dozen systems. So as the system gets bigger, uh, we can actually um, retain or even improve the system performance because um, the, the errors that are introduced are not fundamental to the scale. It's really fundamental to the, to the uh, control hardware. All right, so now uh, there's a bunch of my out of order slides, and I have no idea why these things are so far <laughs> out of order. Yep, tell me where you want to start. All right. What happened? How can it go? <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, well, this still, um, somehow, this, this presentation totally seems to be out of order again. So, um, I don't know what's going on. But... That's interesting. Um, see, my, uh, somehow my title slide is way down here. <laughs> All right, so um, let me actually then um, just uh, move on to the next part of my talk. So we, we start from the, um, the fundamental physics, which I think there's still a lot of interesting physics to be had. Um, but uh, I'd like to see if we can move on to the technological part of it. Um, and when you look at the technology, um, what it, so we, could, we actually talked about uh, the, the crypto analysis, uh, analysis and what it can do. I mean, this actually shows the power of quantum computers in crypto analysis. Okay, so on the x-axis, we have a size of a problem, meaning um, let's, let somebody gives you an n-bit number and you're actually asked to factor this number into two uh, uh, prime factors. And this factoring turns out to be an exponentially difficult problem from all known classical algorithms. Okay? Um, and therefore, if you look at the, the, and then on the vertical axis, it's a log scale of the time to factor an n-bit number. And you can see that this uh, line that goes straight up uh, called NF, uh, NSF, that's called a number field sieve algorithm. That's the best known classical algorithm to factor numbers. You can see that by the time you get to a couple of thousand qubits, 
um, the, uh, the time it takes uh, blows up the billions of years. And that's why we feel like if you use a thousand bit integer um, as a uh, encryption technique, yeah, it will take billions of years to factor and therefore it's pretty safe. Um, so I wouldn't mind sending my credit card information um, uh, over, over internet based on that encryption. Now, what fundamentally changes is that very steep curve, which is an exponential dependence, uh, turns into a polynomial dependence when you go to um, Shor's Shor's algorithm. And this actually assumes a Shor algorithm with a very particular architecture with very particular clock speed. Um, and you know, it's running, it's a clock quantum computer that's running at one hertz, running one logic gate per second. Um, and yeah, a thousand uh, bits, it still takes about a thousand years, so it takes a while. But the real interesting thing is by improving the architecture and clock speed, uh, we can actually improve that like way down. We, we actually fundamentally change the scaling. Um, and then if you think about the um, uh, Moore's law, if, if Moore's law continued, and if we bring that performance uh, up by a factor of a million, you will bring that vertical line, that, that purple steep line down by uh, six orders of magnitude. And that's where that green line is. But you can see that because the scaling is so bad by just going to a 2000 bit integer, you can bring the problem all, all the way back to a billion years, right? Whereas if you go to this polynomial scaling, um, it actually really cracks the code. So, you know, this room uh, of this uh, shaded area um, is where the technological improvements can actually take you. Now, this actually represents about 10 to 12 orders of magnitude improvement in performance. But in Moore's law, in, in classical computers for the course of the last 50 years, we actually have accomplished that. If you look at the computers in the 1970s, early 70s to computers today, um, the performance have gone up by 10 to 12 orders of magnitude. Um, so, you know, this kind of a technological innovation has happened before. Again, it was not driven purely by technology. It was driven by the economic impact it made and, and reinvestment in the growing, growing uh, uh, economy and so on. Um, so I think the key question is, uh, you know, what does it take for us to actually push this, uh, enable this kind of uh, uh, technological innovation in, in quantum computing? All right, so um, this is uh, totally out of order, but... Uh, let me see if I can move to um, the way that we build this, these computers. It's a bit of a pain because of the, the things out of order. We, maybe I'll give up, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, talk about whatever shows up next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me um, jump to um, the, um, um, you know, where, where we are today in terms of its, uh, its system. Oh, actually just one other thing I'd like to show um, is, you know, if you think about building quantum computers, um, even, even when we think about building classical computers, we think about transistors and how they, they uh, store information and all the logic gates that are needed to do the computation. Um, and in analogy, in quantum computing, we have to think about these qubits, which can su uh, support uh, the superposition and entanglement, which is, which is key to quantum computing. Um, but it also has to serve um, uh, these logic operations, logic gate operations. So we feel like if we have the qubits and the logic gate operations, then we have universal quantum computing. Um, but when, you, when it comes down to actually build, designing and building chips, it's actually a little bit more than that. It turns out that in a, in a real chip, uh, we typically have one layer of transistors on the surface of silicon, and then we actually stack up like dozen, about a dozen layers of wiring. And it's really the way things are connected is really what defines the functionality of that chip. So if you think about um, a, a processor engineer who's, who's designing computer chips, they spend all of their time drawing these wires. Okay? Um, and, and therefore, the, the, the way that these qubits are connected and utilized really makes a big difference in terms of its impact on what it can do. Uh, so I'd like to make sure that, you know, when you think about computer architecture, it's really not, doesn't necessarily uh, reduce the devices. We, we start from the devices, of course, a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition to get you um, highly functional um, quantum computers. All right, so, um, let's see. Very hard because uh, all right. 
So um, let me let me see if I can um, get you a sense of uh, um, you know what, what we have been doing in the past. Uh, so this is actually uh, uh, the picture of a um, uh, my colleague Chris Manuel's lab in 2016, about six years ago. I um, mean, this is how a traditional ion trap um, experiment worked, right? So you, you you typically see a big lab with big optical tables. Um, you have uh, tons and tons of little optics that are arranged on an optical table and a bunch of electronics that controls them. Um, and we realized that although this is a great uh, platform to verify all the physics, uh, it's probably not the best way to build um, kind of commercially viable quantum computers. So we actually had to take the next step. <coughs> so now with funding from, from IARPA, what we decided to do is take this very complicated experiment and subdivide them into different functional groups. And these are uh, subsystems that are needed uh, to provide various functionalities to the system. And eventually we put together a system that looks like, um, that's, that's more, much more contained um, and segmented. And once you uh, identify these subsystems, then we can actually continue to introduce new, new technologies to make them better. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have vacuum chambers um, that actually traps the ion. We actually have an ion trap that we collaborated with Sandia and other places to, to, to put together. Uh, we had the CW lasers that are needed to do all the manipulation and um, the, the gate laser. And these are the ones that actually do all the quantum computation. Uh, we have to figure out how to deliver those uh, uh, lasers into the atoms. And then we actually have to have some uh, control systems, which is basically an operating system. Uh, so uh, by putting those together, uh, we've been able to um, start uh, working on, um, um, have a conceptual way to build a system. Now, um, so although we've made a lot of progress, uh, we felt like there's uh, really kind of more advanced technology we can, uh, we can bring in, meaning we have a different need that was served by kind of more traditional approaches in, in science. Um, can we actually now uh, develop new ways to doing things that are much more uh, integrated and, and reliable? Uh, so one example, sorry, this is actually, I, I was, it, this is actually just a, a concept that shows, you know, traditionally we put laser systems uh, like this, um, and there are, you know, uh, lasers on the table, individual mirrors and individual components and, that are assembled. It, it gives you like ultimate flexibility, flexibility to put whatever functionality you want. But over time, these are, you know, the, the, the reliability and repeatability uh, is actually not very good. Meaning if we wanted to assemble something like that together, yeah, you need to get a, a graduate student or a PhD to come into the lab and assemble these things. Um, and uh, as the temperature in the room changes and so on, you know, these things go out of alignment and, and become very, very painful to maintain on a day to day basis. Um, so, um, you know, one of my colleagues, Dana Anderson, um, said, you know, he, he told me, if you know exactly what you want, you can make it really well. <laughs> so uh, we've taken a, a, a very different, fundamentally different approach and says, OK, you know, those optical setups, once you set it up, we, we barely touch them because the functionality is kind of built into the, the setup. Uh, the only thing that we worry about is uh, making sure that all the you know, laser fiber coupling and things like that remain, remain aligned for, for a long time. And that's where the, the difficulty comes in. Uh, so we actually um, started to design all of our optics into a functional blocks. And once you know what the block is, you can then uh, put them into uh, through the optical CAD and go through all the uh, computer aided design process. Um, and then pops out uh, a platform. And then we actually assemble all the optics and all the optical mounts are precision uh, positioned so that by the time you assemble it, they remain roughly aligned. And then it, it turns out that temperature fluctuations and things like that are, are what makes uh, this alignment out of whack. Uh, so what we did is we temperature slab stabilized the base and then, and then put the box on. And when we did that, um, the optical alignment into a single mode fiber, which is typically very sensitive to, to details of the alignment, those things actually we, we typically have to tweak them up, you know, a few times a week. Uh, but with this new setup, we actually didn't have to touch it uh, for a couple of years. Okay, so, so we can actually now resolve some of the day-to-day -day pain um, that the graduate students are used to, uh, to address uh, to, to a different technical approach. Um, and today we um, have managed to put all of these off the optical table and put it onto instrument racks. And more importantly, we actually now put them up, up on the shelf um, that we don't have to touch anymore. Okay, so these things used to be things that you maintain on a daily basis. And today it's boxed up, uh, you put up on the rack and, and you forget about it, right? Because, and of course, every couple of years you have to go and service it, but uh, it's not something that bothers you on a day-to-day -day basis. So this looks like a, a small mundane uh, progress, uh, but it actually makes a difference. If you want to build a commercial systems that are um, you know, uh, used by users who don't know what's in the box, 
um, you can expect them to go in and, and fix uh, on a weekly or, or, or daily basis. Right? So some of these technical advances are, are turned out to be critical. Uh, another thing we try to work very hard, um, again, with, with some collaboration, is, uh, is this vacuum chamber. These, uh, as, you, as I said, you know, these atoms are trapped in, in ultra-high vacuum. Getting very high levels of vacuum really makes the, the, uh, the, the qubit system very robust. And traditional way of uh, getting to ultra high vacuum is we, we make all metal seals and because they're metal seals, they're, they're you know, you, you have this stainless steel um, clamps that, that actually makes the clamps uh, come together. And then you have to bake this thing for weeks and weeks, meaning uh, you raise to the temperature, you get all the water out, you get all the adsorbents out of the surface. Um, so it's, it's more, much more of a ritual. We actually go through the process um, and when, when we go through the process, then the vacuum looks, uh, looks good. Um, and this is a, more of a, a black art. And it's a, it's, there's a lot of science to this um, and lots and lots of experience through the community, uh, but it's very hard to actually make uh, you know, large numbers of these things over time. So as an engineer, every time you see a very difficult pain point in a lab, then you come up and think about a different way to solve the problem. Um, and what we have done is we, uh, we actually created um, uh, an approach where instead of uh, putting all the things into the vacuum to support all the feed fluids and so on, we actually took an approach, the opposite approach, out of the box thinking, to pull everything you don't want in a vacuum chamber out of the vacuum chamber. Okay, so what we have here is we start with from a ceramic uh, pink grid array, ceramic packages, and then we put our iron trap chip in, and then we put the lid on. Um, and then the lid actually has a, a little getter pump, meaning uh, uh, a pump and, uh, and the atomic source. And the trap. That's it. Uh, you pull everything else out of the chamber and shrink the vacuum chamber as small as possible. Uh, so instead of having maybe four or five liters of uh, UHV volume, now we're down to a couple of uh, cubic centimeters of, of, of uh, vacuum volume. But uh, then the question is how do we evacuate this thing and make sure that this thing remains uh, uh, under good vacuum? Um, and this is where uh, we actually collaborated with uh, Cold Quanta, uh, again funding through IARPA programs, uh, to, to actually build this very large UHV facility. So uh, it looks like in order to get to small vacuum, we, we had to build this gigantic vacuum chamber. Uh, but the beauty of this is this is more of a facility. So what we do is uh, we create this facility where we put the trap in, we put this lid in, and inside we actually do certain processing and we seal the chamber. Um, and then out comes this little vacuum package that you can ship. Okay, so uh, we've actually had many um, collaborations with Sandia where um, the Sandia puts the trap onto the package, and the package is sent to Cold Quanta. Uh, they actually assemble the lid, and they ship it to Duke, and then we can actually put it into our experiment, and we're good to go. So we, we don't have to worry about UHV in my lab at all anymore. Okay? Um, and then in order to actually be able to load um, ions onto this, uh, we, we, we develop what's called a... Um, sorry, this is again out of order. We, we develop what's called a laser ablation technique. So in order to create these atoms, you typically have to heat the atoms until uh, you know, individual atomic vapor comes in and then you shoot lasers to photoionize. And once they're ionized, then your, your, your trap can trap it. Um, and usually uh, we have to heat up the metallic source to uh, several hundred degrees C, maybe six, seven hundred degrees C for the, um, for the atoms to sublimate and show up. Um, but what we have done instead is we, we shine laser beam um, and do what's called a laser ablation. We, we um, send in a pretty intense pulse of laser, a nanosecond pulse, um, and then it hits the metal surface and it poofs, creates a little poof. And then if you con control the, the, the levels of that intensity correctly, just, you get just the right amount of atoms. Um, and then we can photoionize and trap it. And the, the nice thing about that is instead of heating some part of the chamber up to you know, six, seven hundred degrees C, all you do is you, you send a single pulse of laser that contains a fraction of a millijoule of energy. Okay? Um, and then we can actually efficiently load. Uh, so this actually shows um, how we optimize the process. Uh, so here, uh, basically, on the right, it on the left, it shows the velocity distribution of the atoms that come out uh, when you when you laser ablate as a function of the ablation energy. But on the right, you show, you know, when I send one optical pulse in to to ablate, what's the probability of me trapping an eye? And you can see that uh, about 15% of the time you don't trap anything, and about 55% of the time we trap one ion about 25% of the time we trap two ions and so on. So on the average, uh, about 86% of the time we trap an ion. And on the average, we trap more than one. Okay, so what this means is I press a button and sends a little puff of, uh, of light pulse, and then boom, I can trap an ion. And this allows you to make that package very small, have a very um, 
a metallic source right next to the ion. And without heating anything up, we can actually uh, uh, load an ion. And this actually works extremely well, especially uh, in our new uh, experimental setups where we actually take the package and cool it down to lower temperatures. And the reason we go down to low temperatures is not because the qubits need lower temperatures, but at lower temperatures, you can get much better vacuum. Okay, so uh, we've actually made some, um, some effort in trying to uh, um, you know, cool this down in a cryogenic uh, system. Uh, so this shows uh, some of our very uh, different approaches to ion trapping, where you know, we start from a commercial um, uh, cryostat, and then um, that middle thing in the, uh, this yellow thing in the middle, um, this is the cold finger, and then we actually put our little package on here and cool the package down to below 10 Kelvin. What happens is uh, then the vacuum levels go really, really high, and now we can trap ions, we can trap chains of ions, and they will stay for weeks. Um, we actually lose the ion, not because of vacuum, but because our laser goes unlocked, okay? So once you load this ion chain in this environment, they're just as good as any other solid state system. They, they just stay forever, okay? Um, and that's mainly because the vacuum pressure is really low, but also uh, you, you're usually limited by collision of the background molecules. Um, but the energy of that molecules uh, in a, um, a sub-10 Kelvin environment is so small that it doesn't perturb the chain at all, okay? So we have seen um, I mean, we try to see what is the rate of this collision. Uh, we're seeing like one collision every, you know, two hours, and it became very, very difficult to, to measure because some, somebody has to wait for days and look at these collision events. Um, so, so we're, we're at this point with, with using this approach and very compact vacuum, um, we can actually get to uh, ion chains that are extremely robust, right? So we don't have to reload ions at all. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, you know, because everything is sitting at 4 Kelvin or, or 10 Kelvin, uh, we, we, we can't really heat part of the system up to 600 degrees C to load because everything's so small. So this laser ablation uh, approach works really well. So this is kind of the, uh, the setup. We, we showed some chains. We're seeing really good, good performance. Um, and then we also made sure that this uh, approach, because we're addressing them with laser beams, any kind of mechanical vibration is going to uh, introduce systematic errors. So we have to make sure that the vibration is extremely stable. Uh, the laser beams are brought in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a stable manner. Uh, but all of those are kind of engineering issues uh, that can get us to, to high performance systems. Uh, so, you know, so you can see um, that we have a commercial cryostat um, here uh, in the middle. And you can see that all the optics is laid out as we discussed in, in, in the previous form. Um, and now we can actually just um, you know, put all of these different optical functional modules onto the, around the system, um, and then we, we box them up to, to, to be stable, and then they, they become a platform for, for an extremely stable quantum computing platform. Um, so you know, these are some of the technology areas that we have been um, um, investing in, um, in collaboration with many of our partner companies and, and other research uh, academic institutions. Um, and now I think we're, we're getting to a point where um, we can actually think about uh, scaling into the future. Now, uh, before we, uh, we do that, I'd like to then jump into, oh, actually there's one other thing I wanted to, to show, and this one seems to still be in order. Um, when we make these uh, small um, packages and put them into cryostats and get the very stable systems, we also were, but, but you know, the downside is we still need a cryostat. I mean, it's, it's not like a, a very, very exotic cryostat, but it still needs a cryostat. Um, so the, the next question is, you know, can we actually get this uh, kind of small compact packages to work at room temperature? Uh, so this is actually an effort uh, led by Colquanta. They um, actually had some collaborate, to, uh, some funding from, um, I think, uh, Army and, and DOD um, agencies. Um, and we basically took the concept and they actually just attached a, a little uh, ion pump uh, technology they had. And that ion pump is about two inches tall, about one inch diameter in cylinder. So now our vacuum chamber really is something that is this small that we can we can actually ship from from, from cold quanta to Duke. Um, and then you know we actually uh, put together all of our optics around it uh, to actually trap an ion. And you can see that this was the the first effort where the, the chamber was small but all the optics was kind of traditional and, and you see that it's, it's spread out all over the place. Um, so we, then we say, okay, now we can successfully trap in these things. Now, can we actually now design a system that's more, much more compact? Um, and this is kind of where we, we ended up. So in the middle of this thing, we have uh, uh, one of those little room temperature chambers that's mounted upside down. So it's all underneath this little box. 
Um, and then we also came up with um, uh, ways to put multiple wavelengths of uh, single mode uh, uh, lasers into a single fiber using this photonic crystal fiber technology. Um, so we actually have uh, basically two uh, fibers on either side. There's one more uh, fiber for the, for the ablation. Um, and that, this allows you to trap an ion like entirely. So if you look at the, the original 2016 setup, we had like two or three optical tables. One optical table was just about the chamber and all the, all the surrounding optics. We really distilled it down to something that looked like this, um, just over the, over the course of, uh, of a few years. So I think this all also shows that there is a, a lot of room for technology innovation uh, that will actually take this uh, very, uh, what seemingly unwieldy uh, approach to ion trap quantum computing and then put them into much more manageable and potentially manufacturable uh, uh, platform. So it's kind of one of the most exciting things I feel like um, I, I was engaged in uh, over the last four or five years. All right, so uh, then uh, let me jump to the last part of my talk, uh, which is about, uh, about the users. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. So, so the last question is, uh, you know, what can you do uh, with, uh, with quantum computers? And here I'd like to see if we can uh, put in a user's hat. You just think about your, your little kids doing homework, a middle school homework, sitting in front of a computer connected to the internet, okay? So, so there, the, the kids are learning, um, but they really don't know exactly what's going on inside your computers or inside your internet to actually bring that information to you. Uh, so this is where now, um, if uh, there's a lot of effort commercializing quantum computers by, uh, by INQ and many other companies, uh, uh, and if we continue to be successful, uh, there'll come a time where quantum computers become a tool. Just like you know, we would buy a computer, like a laptop, um, hopefully it doesn't randomize the order of slides. <laughs> um, or we can buy an HPC facility in a lab and then you utilize that to do science, you utilize that to do uh, engineering, and sometimes you utilize to, that um, to, to create valuable services to your customers in a commercial sense. Um, so what are some of the near-term, uh, useful near-term uh, quantum algorithms? Um, and we are thinking about uh, quantum machine learning, quantum chemistry and material studies, and optimization problems. Um, and you know, these are prevalent in um, um, in um, uh, research fields, they're prevalent in, um, in industry, um, a lot of government needs for, for these types of problems. Um, and it looks like the quantum computers are, uh, are there to provide uh, an entirely new approach to this, right? So I'd like to take us all the way back to the, to the 70s, uh, when the computers are about to come out. And uh, imagine you're a chemist, um, and your traditional way of doing chemistry research is you go into the lab and mix chemicals and see what the reaction is. Now you do have some theoretical models from physical chemistry uh, where um, you, you apply like you know, quantum theory to, to think about how they, um, how they react. But most of them were done on a piece of, of paper with a pencil, um, theoretical work, or you go into the lab. And when somebody hands you like a number crunching machine, uh, you first of all, you say, okay, what can I do this? How can I use this to do to better chemistry? And, and the, the, um, the, the path is not entirely clear. But then what you do is because you know what this number crunching machine can do really well, you think about ways to map your problem uh, to utilize that capability. Okay? And that's where the computational chemistry um, has, has really started. And some of the early demonstration of computational chemistry applications was actually not very dramatic. It was very mundane. Um, but over time, as the computers get better and people get more innovative, you actually think about how to utilize this exponentially growing power of number crunching machines to understand chemistry. And today, chemistry is so far beyond anything else we imagine because of the capability to do computation. Sim similar is true in physics. We, we do a lot of computational physics and modeling. Similar is true in engineering. I told you about all of the opticals, optics we're laying out with, uh, with the help of the computers. Without computers, none of those advances would have been possible. Right? So today, we use that as a tool and it's not, um, the tool uh, actually sometimes does not come with the way, uh, the methodology to use them well. So I think there's a lot of room for innovation in learning how to use this entirely new tool, leverage and utilize this, this entirely new tool and apply it to the problems that are difficult today. Okay? Uh, so this is not replacing classical computers with quantum computers. I think that the opportunity is coming up with an entirely new way to tackle your problem using quantum computers as a new tool because quantum computers can be so much fundamentally different than any classical computers that you have. Even more so than a piece of paper and a pencil, 
uh, versus a classical number crunching machine. Right? The, the difference can actually be bigger. Um, so um, what's really encouraging is people have uh, started to come up with some like proofs, uh, fundamental proofs, um, that even in machine learning, sometimes the quantum um, algorithm can give you better uh, performance compared to a classical uh, machine, uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, and, and at the same time, there's also a lot of very practical innovations people are coming up with to actually tackle a real problem, a real um, real world problem with, with quantum uh, machine learning techniques. Um, and we're finding out that there are opportunities to, uh, to do well. So uh, I can give you an example of uh, um, pattern recognition. Okay jumps into my conclusion slide somehow. Let me see where that, that example is. Didn't eliminate the slides, there it is. All right, so a uh, first example is uh, pattern recognition, or we call it the classifiers. And this is a very classical, classic uh, machine learning problem where in that picture I show you the picture of uh, three different classes of irises. Um, and then there's a database that says um, a, a picture of class A iris, a picture of class B iris, and, and picture of class C iris. What you do is you create this machine learning model and tweak the parameters that can differentiate between these three different classes. Okay, and then you train the model. And then the next thing you do is I give you a random picture and your goal is to decide which one of these three, three irises that you fall into. And very similar thing, you, we, we get trained by looking at a lot of cats and dogs, and we can differentiate them. And then sometimes somebody gives you a picture of a, an animal, and, and based on your you know, recognition mechanism, you identify whether it's, a, whether it's a cat or a dog. And there's always something that looks something, some, something in between. Sometimes you have a hard time identifying whether this animal picture is a cat or a dog. And you know, machines are, are, are confused by that kind of a thing, too. So we start with, from two different data, data sets. One is the picture of irises, and the, the other is these handwritten digits of zero through, through nine. Um, and this is a collaboration we did with uh, QCWare maybe a couple of years ago. Um, and the idea is to create a training model um, that creates these uh, clusters and, and calculates the centroid in this, in this um, transition space. Okay? Um, and then the, the, the next question is when a, a new data point is given, then you, you calculate the distance between your new point to these three centroids using quantum mechanical methods. Um, and then you identify which one is the closest. And then you, you identify your picture with that class. Okay, that's called a classifier problem. Um, and you know, in this case, we uh, were able to, uh, this is an example of uh, using an eight qubit quantum computer. Um, and this was actually using the quantum computers at INQ. Um, but using the eight qubit quantum computer to recognize, uh, differentiate between uh, all these different characters. The first one is differentiating between zero and one. Uh, the blue is our raw data, and then orange is the one where we did a little bit of error mitigation. Um, and then the black diamond is a classical uh, centroid uh, classifier. Okay, so you can see that the performance of a uh, error mitigated uh, quantum, uh, eight qubit quantum computer um, and the classical um, classifier, centroid classifier performance is very comparable. Okay, you can see that zero and one, yeah, it can differentiate very well. They look very different. Two and seven, they can be a little confusing. You know, they all have like this kind of a, a shape from, you know, round top and, and, and straight down. Uh, so they can get a little bit more confusing. Um, but even uh, the differentiating uh, among all nine uh, different shapes is, is quite feasible using, using a very small scale quantum computer. So then the, the natural question is, you know, can you go to more, more complex uh, image recognition problems um, as your quantum computer gets better? And that's, a, that's an open question. At what point um, you know, can you actually start to do um, comparable or better than classical classifiers? Uh, I think that's a very open problem question because in many applications, this image recognition and classification turns out to be a very difficult and challenging problem for, um, for quant uh, classical uh, algorithms as well. Now, this is another example where we uh, looked at the joint probability distributions. Um, and this is actually a, a pretty widely known problem in, um, in, um, in various areas, including finance. So here, uh, we, we work with uh, Fidelity Center for Applied uh, Technology. It's just like an R&D arm for Fidelity, um, a, a financial firm. Um, and they actually brought us a problem. I have uh, this data, historic data, of uh, stock price correlations between Microsoft and Apple. Okay? Um, and that, if you plot that in a, in a distribution, it looks like that orange distribution. So there's largely some correlation. 
Uh, but there are a bunch of outliers because you know in general um, they're in the same sector, tech sector, so they you know they they tend to move together. But at the same time, uh, you know iOS and Microsoft Windows is competition. Sometimes when you have good news for one, the other one can go down. So there can be some anti-correlation as well. Uh, so if you look at the probability distribution, it actually has that shape. And the question is, can I come up with a model um, from which I can sample that probability distribution so I can actually do some more predictive studies into the future? Um, and there is a classical uh, GAN. GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network. This is where if you have a good machine learning classifier, you actually give a, uh, the classifier a question. And if it can differentiate it, then you actually tweak your input until it, it gets confused. Meaning you, you try to see if you can uh, kind of uh, uh, work against a classifier to make sure that you generate samples that look exactly like the real so that the classifier cannot tell. Okay, this is kind of the mechanism you use to, to generate these uh, machine learning models. And if you look at the classical GAN, yeah, it kind of you know, generates a, a pattern that is similar. But you see two things, that there seems to be a very clear boundary below which we're not getting any samples. And that probably is the limitation of the model. And a lot of the outliers, you can see that the distribution is, uh, is, is actually missing. So um, although they generate some models after 20,000 iterations of training, um, there, there, there's um, a lot that is um, dissimilar to that. Now we can actually use uh, what's called a quantum GAN, also a quantum CBM. C CBM stands for our circuit bone models. Um, these are different types of uh, uh, quantum uh, machine learning techniques. But here what we do is we start from an entangled state. Okay, it's a resource that classical models don't have. But in, in, classic, in quantum models, you can actually have a much more complex and rich um, structure into it because you can utilize uh, you know, entanglement and so on. So here we start from an entangled state, we make some projections, and then it, we actually um, make measurements to, to tweak the model. You can see that with very, very few training iterations, we can actually start to approach the actual distribution's characters much, much better. Um, so again, I think these are some examples where, you know, if you bring a problem to us where classical computers and classical machine learning is struggling, we can actually think about like entirely new ways to represent the problem and see if we can come up with, uh, with a more competitive and, and alternative answers. All right, so um, I think we, um, I'd like to see if I can bring one more, um, yeah, one more application example. Sorry, oh, okay, so, so here is another example uh, where um, we, this is actually a, a, a generation. Once we have a classifier, as I said, we can actually create a model so that the classifier will, will, be, will be confused. And then you create uh, artificial samples that look like a real, real sample. Uh, so if you look at this picture on the right, this collaboration we did with Opata, uh, you know, these handwritten digits on the right are actually generated by quantum computers. The quantum computers drew that, okay? And you can see that they look very, very similar to, to an actual handwritten digit. Okay, so we can actually um, use, um, and, and again, these are still relatively small set of samples, but um, these are kind of real world problems. Uh, we're approaching that already. So. Um, so, th so this is like a synthetic data generated by quantum computers. And you can see that when you look at its performance, they are actually comparable, sometimes better in terms of this uh, metrical inception score uh, that they can actually do um, better than classical models. And this again used, uh, I think an 8-bit quantum computer to do it. Um, and then this is an example where uh, we did not know this, but uh, uh, some group at Volkswagen um, have used our quantum computers to, to do some optimization problems, uh, run some optimization problems in, uh, in the early stage. Um, so, you know, I'd like to see if we can um, then, um, wh when we think about these real world, potentially real world problems, um, you know, what is the best way um, to actually uh, characterize the performance of a quantum computer? And I think that um, is a, a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, potentially controversial topic. Um, but I think we, uh, one of the, the, the real uh, values of uh, defining a good metric um, is, is, of course, you know, people are interested in comparing one quantum computer to the other. Um, but, you know, finding the right metric to do that, I think, is, is very important. So, uh, you know, what, what's going on in the literature, to be very, very frank, is everybody's com coming up with their uh, performance metric where their computers work, look better than, than others, right? That's happening all the time. Um, but I think in the long run, uh, the real uh, measure of metric is not to not among the, the vendors of quantum computers to, to, um, to promote, but really what can users do with it? 
Right? How do we actually make, measure the utility of a quantum computer to a user? Okay? Um, and that, I think, is, is really the, the interesting question. Um, so um, let me see if I can go back to that other, this one. Oh, there we go. Um, so, um, you know, if you look at the currently used metrics, uh, whether it's number of physical qubits, what the gate fidelity is, and so on, and these are all tend to be more of a device level metrics that uh, builders of quantum computers pay a lot of focus on this, right? What's my architecture? How do I get better gate fidelity and so on? Uh, but they uh, sometimes don't necessarily translate to what a user can do with a computer, okay? And, and you know, this, this actually has been the trend in the early days of classical computers too, right? Moore's law keeps track of how many transistors you have on the square, cent square inch of, uh, of, uh, of a chip and so on. And there was a time when we paid a lot of attention to the clock speed of a processor, right? In the, in the 90s and early 2000s, um, the clock speed of your processor got better. I have a 400 megahertz processor, 500, 700, 900. Uh, but it turns out that the clock speed has been stuck at about three gigahertz for the last 15 years <coughs> because that's what we, we, <coughs> we kind of hit the limit. Um, but our, our, our computers definitely have gotten much, much better over the last 15 years. Right? So sometimes these uh, uh, device level metrics don't necessarily translate to, to performance for, for users. Uh, so the classical computing industry has come up with an answer uh, where they actually do the benchmarking based on algorithms. Okay? So if you look at the, the, the standard high performance computer benchmark called spec benchmarks, what it is is you go to the spec benchmark webpage and there's a, a list of algorithms, um, typically a few dozen of them, um, that represents different types of problems that, that you may be interested in solving with your, with your computer. Okay? Um, and then um, they, they run these uh, up, uh, standard benchmark algorithms on, on your machines and you publish the data. And if you're interested in saying, um, I'm, I'm interested in doing this type of number crunching, then I go into the list and say, this problem looks most representative of what I want to do. And then you can actually go there and compare how every vendor's uh, machines compare with each other. So this is really, when you do it this way, uh, you're really looking, you, you're really kind of abstracting all of the details of how the computer is built, but focusing on what you can actually do for a customer or, or, or user. Um, so um, I think this is, uh, Potentially interesting because it also it becomes a dialogue between the users of quantum computers and the vendors, and I, I'd love to hear what uh, say somebody working on quantum chemistry is having problem with, and once I learn what their challenges are, then I can actually start to develop my quantum computer to actually serve that kind of a customer better. So I think you know, that becomes the real utility of a benchmark is to make sure that the users and the and the developers can actually talk to each other so that, that you come up with a better utility. Uh, so, you know, QEDC, uh, this is Quantum Economic Development Consortium, um, they had um, created a little um, a te uh, technical subcommittee to look at uh, how should we benchmark in these things and so on. And they came up with a list of uh, quantum algorithms that people are typically interested in doing. And then they, um, you know, created that as a very similar to specs concept. They, they uh, came up with a standard set of algorithms that people should run. And then we actually just look at how, how, well it, how well it works out. And then from there, we, we actually, from that kind of a concept and approach, we, we developed uh, what's called a, uh, um, uh, a algorithmic qubit as a single number metric. Uh, but the, basically, it's, it's, a, it's more of a volumetric metric, volumetric uh, benchmark that tells you if you had a quantum computer of certain size, what is the typical complexity of circuits you can run? Right, it just extracts that, but really it's based on uh, this list of algorithms that uh, the quantum algorithms that people uh, generally are interested in, in running. And I think over time we can take this approach, increase the list and agree on the list of algorithms that should be uh, reflected um, and see if we can uh, find the standardized ways of a user experience so that people can drive the utility up. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to see if I can find my conclusion slide. Um, Sorry about all the uh, out of order <laughs> presentations. Um, let's see if I can get to a different page. There we go. So I feel like uh, you know quantum computers. I think all of us agree that quantum computers provide a fundamentally new way of computation. It's not replacing classical computers. Just like classical computers have, have enabled so many new applications, I think this has the potential uh, to en enable so many new applications 
by providing a fundamentally different tool set. And I think that's kind of where the real opportunity is. It really started out in physics, uh, but it's transitioning to technology really fast, especially as many of these companies are, are focusing on how to take this fundamental and make them more useful to potential users. Um, there are new types of algorithms uh, that enable new types of uh, enabling new types of applications that are being found um, every every week. Um, and then there are uh, very new opportunities for coming up with very novel computer architectures to serve them. Um, the fully programmable quantum computers are starting to become available, even for those people who don't know how to build one. You can actually have an access to one, whether it's through um, the cloud services that many companies provide today or, or by collaboration with some of these companies and research groups. Um, and this really provides uh, a testing ground for novel quantum algorithms for those people who don't necessarily know how to build uh, quantum computers, right? Just by working with, uh, just similar to how you access HPCs. You don't have to know how to build an HPC. If you can actually know how to work with a, a vendor and then figure things out, uh, then you can come up with a lot of useful applications for that. Um, and the progress in uh, machine learning, chemistry, QAOA, um, these are, um, you know, um, are, are starting to really show that some useful um, pro problems can actually be tackled with these. Um, and then, you know, the question is, how do we continue to optimize it so that quantum computers at some point in the future, or hopefully in the near future, can start to deliver performances uh, that are going to uh, outperform classical computers? And I think there's just a lot of room for innovation in that application and optimization space. Um, so, um, you know, the, um, there, there is a chance, I believe, um, that uh, even NISC uh, quantum computers before full uh, error correction, uh, we may be able to find some uses for it. Um, of course, um, the holy grail is to get to much more scalable systems into the future. Uh, so I, I do believe that um, you know, there is, uh, I think we're on track as a community and society uh, to reach uh, commercially useful applications in some of these quantum computers uh, in the relatively near future. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can all kind of look into um, uh, participating uh, innovation at various scales and uh, creating collaborative efforts between different uh, parties uh, to come up with a useful application. Because that first application is what's going to get the snowball rolling uh, towards that economies of scale in the virtual cycle. So with that, I'd like to thank for your uh, attention. And sorry about all the <laughs> dancing I had to do <laughs> with out of order slides. Thank you. Apologies for the technical issues, but we actually have a yeah. saying in the Air Force. Yeah. Flexibility is the key to air power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with this idea, uh, we'll slide a little bit. We have time for a few questions here uh, before we break. Okay. Yeah. You had a slide about um, Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that, that's a great, great question. I think, you know, that, that slide came from 2005 and people have come up with much more efficient ways to do these um, uh, factoring since. Um, but um, there, the, um, some of the architectural advantage I glossed, glossed over is, uh, you know, if you're limited to nearest neighbor, right, only nearest neighbor and doing one gate at a time, then it takes a long time. Just by being able to run concurrent gates, meaning one thing's in parallel, you can actually reduce that time to solution by a factor of 100 if you can actually have a large com computer that you can run things together. Uh, it also turns out that if you have, um, one of the things that was noted in that paper is called an abstract concurrent architecture. Abstract means somehow I can take a qubit here and a qubit here and apply two qubit gates without worrying about where the qubit is. Now, if you're allowed to do that, um, then you can go, I mean, a lot of these uh, factoring algorithms are built on um, kind of modular exponentiation and then, and then quantum Fourier transform, right? The modular exponentiation is really built out of adders, like digital adders that add numbers, right? Um, and those adders, um, classically, they're, the way that we do add addition in, in grade school is what called the ripple carry. We look at the least significant digit and then we pull the carry forward and do the next one and the next one and so on. And that's a linear depth adder as a function of the, the bit size. Uh, but the, the real world um, adders in our computers today um, are based on logarithmic depth adders. So you can actually build, um, if you have a, a very well-connected architecture, um, you can actually do the addition in logarithmic depth. 
Okay, and, and, and these are kind of architectural changes you can go to really reduce the speed. And uh, of course, you know, as the numbers get thousand bits long, right, linear depth versus logarithmic depth makes a huge difference, right? Um, so, you know, these are some of the things that people have looked at. Um, based on the architecture, you can actually imp implement different algorithms uh, to make things go faster. So there's a, a lot of room for algorithmic innovation if uh, you have a, a uh, architectural um, innovation associated with it. So that, that's some of the details there. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. I mean, if you think about the general framework of quantum error correction, right, um, it, it actually really um, started developing in the late 90s when people didn't understand what is the nature of the errors in any given system, right? And that's just because the, the experiments were so far behind and, the, and the, the, the theorists actually assumed the worst case errors, which means depolarizing error can fail in all possible ways in an equal way, and then they built very robust uh, quantum error correction systems around that. Now, it turns out that if you look at where a practical error correction is used, and, and a classic example is communications, right? When you have your cell phone talking, um, there are, um, the channel is so crappy uh, that we actually have to introduce a lot of error correction and mitigation techniques. Um, and the way you do that, uh, and, and another example is optical communications, right? Um, there, you're, you look at the, the biggest errors, and it's always systematic. For example, in optical communications, attenuation is your, your, your lead uh, challenge. Right? So what you do is you introduce optical amplifiers to actually boost the signal before, before the signal to noise ratio goes down to noise. The next thing in the fiber, there's this thing called dispersion, which means your, your short pulse will actually now get dispersed in, in frequency. And they, they stretch out and they overlap. But it's not a random error. It's a very systematic error. What we do is we do dispersion compensation to bring that back. Right? So what you do is once you understand what the error source and the nature of the error is, um, the most effective way tends to be mitigation. Right? Or you, you, you either undo it, or you actually come up with a, with a system where that problem is less severe. Right? And in the optical communications, only at the very end, you apply forward error correction. Because error correction is expensive, because you actually have to uh, allocate a lot of resources, especially quantum error correction seems to be extremely expensive. So um, I think the, 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 the way we tackle these things is first, you have to really understand your physical system. If you understand where your errors are coming from, there are lots of different tools that you can use, and you try to come up with the most effective way to tackle that error until you, you move on, to, and then you move on to the next error, right? And at some point, in um, your error, error mitigation and hardware improvement will, will hit a wall, and then I think you're forced to introduce error correction. But, um, you know, I think these are different tool sets, and today we're in a situation where the systems have advanced so much on so many different platforms, not only in iron trash, but in superconducting qubits and everything else, um, once you understand the nature of your error, I think you can come up with uh, different tools uh, to tackle them. And I think that's where a lot of the opportunity for architecture is going into the future. Thank you. Let's thank your speaker. We'll now uh, take a 10 minute break and reconvene. And of course, those who have talks coming up, please uh, get with our control center and make sure everything's in order. Thank you. All right, it's my honor to uh, kick off our next section, which is quantum industry perspectives. Uh, we have a few talks here uh, from some of the leaders in the quantum industry. Uh, fortunately, Rigetti had to cancel at the last minute due to a family emergency from our speaker, so hopefully everything's okay there. But um, we're gonna kick it off today with a great colleague of ours that we've worked with for many years, Dr. Jerry Chow, who's fellow and director of quantum infrastructure at IBM. And with Jerry's responsibilities include setting the strategy for the quantum system roadmap, working with hardware portfolio leaders and setting the research areas to target, and also ensuring op optimal customer and client value. He co-led the IBM quantum experience with uh, Dr. Jay Gambetta, uh, back in 2016, which really put the first uh, quantum computer on the cloud and really I thought represented a real breakthrough uh, for the area. So with that, let me turn it over to Jerry. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for, for uh, 
inviting me today and also to be a part of this really exciting uh, program with uh, all of you today uh, and, and over these next few days. It's, it's, it's exciting to see um, how much uh, infrastructure is built up here and, and, and exciting to see the labs and everything. So uh, what I want to do is I want to give the uh, IBM perspective about uh, quantum computing, but, but from a, a slightly different lens, especially as we are progressing on uh, a lot of these technology roadmaps, it, it, it's pretty clear that um, we, we need to see um, how quantum fits within the picture, the broader picture of supercomputing in general. And so I want to give a little bit of that vision of what we, what we see for the future in terms of uh, what we're calling quantum-centric supercomputing. Now, um, as, as Mike mentioned, since uh, 2016, when we first put the system, uh, a, a simple five qubit chip on the cloud, uh, really a lot has progressed. And uh, our sort of MO at IBM has been to uh, lean on to our historic uh, uh, roadmap culture, right? And in terms of technology development, um, really focus on how to continually advance and push the envelope on driving new innovations that lead to uh, new products and new technologies into new quantum hardware. And so from a hardware perspective, I like to show this in terms of the, the last three years, a big core, core part of our focus has been to uh, drive advances in terms of delivering the latest and greatest quantum, uh, uh, quantum computing processors. And so we work with superconducting qubits. Uh, what you see here is an evolution of uh, our, our, our processor technology from uh, Falcon, which is at 27 qubits in 2019, to Hummingbird, 65 qubits in 2020, and then most recently to Eagle, uh, 127 qubits in 2021. Now, um, today what we have is actually uh, deployed uh, on our uh, IBM, uh, IBM cloud over 20, uh, over 20 quantum systems that are available. And these range uh, from uh, that 127 qubit system that I mentioned before, this, this Eagle processor, all the way down to simple five qubit processors that are used, uh, freely accessible and usable by, uh, by students for, for exploration. Uh, now, all these systems are accessible you know, via our IBM Quantum Network, which is a uh, really diverse business ecosystem of uh, various different players in terms of uh, getting, uh, building adoption and, and, and getting engaged from, uh, uh, from various different areas, including academia, national labs, um, Fortune 500 companies, uh, but all part of uh, our, our ecosystem in order to, to, to drive the total amount of usage in terms of running quantum circuits on real, real quantum hardware. Uh, and um, you know, just in terms of the, the, the actual services that we provide, they're all, uh, all the details in terms of their performance metrics, in terms of the number of qubits, their uh, operational fidelities and their uh, quantum volume and, and, and speed by which you can run quantum circuits are all avail available on our website. Now, really since 2016, though, a big part of um, the whole effort, right, even with the quantum experience, has been to drive adoption. Um, uh, and we can see this growth uh, just in the last few years, just in terms of how much influence quantum has had um, and in, in, in various different areas, including, um, uh, including the number of, of total users, uh, including the total number of, of papers and research outputs that, are, that, that, that have actually been able to use, make use of uh, these quantum services. Uh, and in, in addition to that, um, uh, the amount of learning that has been in, in enabled, right? And just, uh, it's exciting to see just the, the coursework uh, out there in different universities that are actually engaged in using some of the, uh, the, the quantum um, services that we have uh, made available through the cloud. Um, and uh, a big part of this, right, uh, driving this adoption is really to, to show that there is this, uh, effectively, this exponential growth uh, in the demand of quantum circuits, right? Uh, and so therefore, we need, uh, from, uh, from a hardware pr perspective, we need to be able to meet that demand and continue to grow, uh, and it's sort of a feedback loop there within, right? As, as much as the case with a lot of technology development. Uh, now, I do want to take a step back, though, in terms of looking at what exactly is the fundamental aspect of, of, um, of, of, of quantum computing that we're really trying to get towards the bottom of that provides advantage. Um, and in the end, it's the quantum circuit. Right? So we talk a lot about qubits, and qubits can be uh, these different constructs of, of, of physical implementations. Right? We heard about trapped ions, certainly superconducting qubits, spin qubits. Uh, but really, it's the quantum circuit and it's the collection of operations and gates that you run on those quantum circuits uh, that give a, any real potential advantage over classical uh, computing. 
right? Just like how we have a circuit model for how we can define uh, classical computation circuits, there's a uh, quantum circuit formalism, formalism as well, from which we we, we grow the basis of of, of uh, applications and and you know and and use cases. Uh, and what's interesting here is that when you group the quantum circuits by different areas for where they can be applied, you start to find these collections of circuits, uh, which effectively have um, uh, which you would you have difficulty uh, mimicking or simulating using classical means. Uh, but drive uh, drive use cases in this in, in three particular uh, areas. So there's uh, simulating nature, uh, which was discussed previously, and previously, and that's really due to the fundamental fact that uh, nature is quantum mechanical, right? And so that uh, representing uh, the 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 world that we can describe using quantum mechanics is best to done is actually best done in in terms of a quantum circuit formalism. Think of the quantum circuit as a uh, novel data representation that is best suited for explaining these types of uh, uh, simulation and these types of natural problems. Uh, then there's data with structure, right? And so, you know, we heard a little bit in, in Jung Sang's talk about, about machine learning. Uh, but really, the, the concept here is that there's particular types of um, data out there that have a rich uh, inherent mathematical structure to it that is best suited for classification or for learning using quantum circuit, using a quantum circuit formalism. And so using quantum kernel estimations, uh, it, it becomes possible to actually have provable advantage for certain kinds of data with structure. And this has, uh, you know, implications in machine learning. Uh, in fact, Shor's algorithm is one subset of this type of data with uh, structure type of case, right? Uh, and then also certainly for things, uh, other problems that are well known like ranking and, and so forth. And then there's a third area, which is, um, uh, 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 we'll call it um, non-exponential speedups, but they're more polynomial speedups, but, but which also have a tremendous amount of uh, potential impact in terms of um, uh, optimization and uh, financial types of application for opt uh, portfolio optimization, sampling. Those types of polynomial speedups are also important to, to capture. Um, now, the, the key point, though, is that the quantum circuit is what gives the potential for quantum advantage. And the key thing, right, for us to actually drive towards useful quantum advantage is twofold. For one, we need to find those applications that are going to be useful, right, that can actually make use of difficult quantum circuits, right, quantum circuits that you effectively need quantum hardware to run on. And so to that end, we have a really diverse network of partners, which we're working with in order to find those types of problems, those types of applications to uh, make use of quantum circuits in the best, in the best manner possible. Um, for example, AFRL is one of our really uh, important hub members that we've, we've partnered with uh, on that front to, 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 to find, um, uh, to build an ecosystem around uh, looking for those types of challenging quantum circuits and making use of the services that we provide. But then the second uh, part of the coin uh, is to actually have the quantum hardware on which you can run this complex, these, quant these complex quantum circuits. And, and, to, um, and to that end, there's a number of different elements that come into play with uh, improving the quantum hardware, uh, but we want to do so in a, in a way that, that progresses along a, a roadmap so that we're able to drive certain elements that show progress to get towards those uh, circuits of value to provide quantum advantage. Okay. And so um, what's really phenomenal is that, you know, we're in this, we're in this um, regime now, right, where we're building hardware uh, and we're exploring quantum circuits and we have the opportunity to find the best sorts of hardware efficient uh, circuits that might lead towards applications and you can actually uh, test them and run them on real, uh, on, on real, uh, real hardware. Um, and uh, to that front, there are uh, in those different areas of application that I mentioned, there are there are uh, circuits with provable potential quantum advantages, uh, so long as the with with actual complexity proofs that allow us to explore things in say um, uh, in in a simulation of of, of molecular structures uh, or with certain types of time dynamics problems or in uh, the case of certain kinds of uh, uh, kernel estimations for machine learning. Um, and so um, what's actually interesting is that uh, with the running of these quantum circuits um, comes in comes the question of how do you run those quantum circuits and what are the resources that are required 
to run those most challenging and difficult quantum circuits that lead towards potential quantum advantage. Um, and this is not talked about a lot, but with different types of error mitigation strategies and error, um, you know, we talked, it was discussed a little bit in, in, in Jung Sang's talk, but with different error, error mitigation strategies, it becomes possible to define an effective runtime for an actual uh, application or, or, or um, application of interest that you might have to get the solution through a, running a lot of quantum circuits. And so there's actually a, a, a number of factors that come into this runtime. So even with noisy systems today, the whole point is that if you, you can account for some of the errors by running more circuits, there's these error cancellation techniques. And so the things that come into play for this runtime uh, value um, are obviously the number of qubits that you, you can run uh, the circuits over. Uh, there's the actual circuit time that it, 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 it takes to run uh, an operation on the actual uh, uh, quantum hardware. And then there's also a noise factor in terms of how well do you can, can you actually run these circuits faithfully without incurring additional errors, which influences the effective uh, overall runtime to, to get us time to the solution. And so for these different areas, it's important to, 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 to see that this drives us to push our technology in three dimensions. Scale, to push the number of qubits up. Uh, quality, in order to reduce that noise factor and to improve the quality by which we can actually run the circuits. And speed. Effectively, you need to be able to get a large throughput of these circuits through in order to actually effectively get uh, the, the solutions that you want in a reasonable amount of time. And so what's interesting is that when we start to compare this, uh, this, this journey that we have of, of overcoming the, the capabilities of what a classical computer can do, we can start to see where the trade-offs and where the uh, boundary conditions and phase transitions can be, right? So uh, with regards to any sort of quantum circuit, we know that there's going to be a, a challenging set of quantum circuits. As we know, as it scales, we know that there's gonna be an exponential set of resources that we're gonna require for challenging quantum circuits to use a classical simulation method. Now, the beauty of Shor's algorithm is it gives us a linear scaling uh, using fault tolerant quantum error correction. This is the green curve. And so the, the traditional wisdom tells us that we want to be able to build towards quantum error correction and effectively you know, surpass the, 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 uh, this red curve, right, which is the, the, the scalability of, of our classical resources to, to best simulate quantum, uh, uh, quantum circuits. Uh, by building logical qubits and then scaling. But with error mitigation, it gives us a different strategy. Error mitigation gives us a much more continuous path by which we still have an exponential dependence on resources, but a much shallower one. And this is where some of those aspects of that runtime equation I, I described come in, in terms of trading off resources with the amount of error that you have in your actual system, as well as the total number of circuits you can actually uh, expect to see quantum advantage sooner through using many of these new error mitigation techniques on a continuous path to still get us towards quantum error correction in the long run. And so this is why we're so excited. This is what is so exciting about this current period of time, which we're building hardware, which is right on the cusp of this uh, crossover point uh, to, to beat the best known classical simulations uh, of some of these most challenging uh, quantum, uh, quantum circuits. And in fact, uh, we're already starting to see that in some of our uh, own internal demonstrations of, of looking at complex quantum circuits. Uh, the, on the left side, um, we're actually showing the, the results of a 50 qubit observable, right? And uh, running a 50 qubit circuit and using, using error cancellation techniques, being able to get uh, basically the recovery of the full expectation values that, that, that one would expect to, to, to find versus running it uh, without any sort of error can cancellation techniques. Uh, but a big part of this is reducing the, 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 the noise in the system and increasing the overall quality of the circuits that you can run. Um, and a big part of this is how quantum and classical all come together. And a lot of these, class, a lot of these cancellation techniques involve this interplay of, of uh, traditional computing with quantum computing, taking large quantum circuits, breaking them down into smaller pieces that can be knit together uh, and run on, 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 on the actual uh, uh, noisy quantum hardware that we have today. And so really the, the, the path to making um, uh, these quantum circuits run on quantum hardware towards quantum advantage is scale, quality, and speed, right? And so from our roadmap perspective, we've, we've driven uh, scale year after year, uh, as I mentioned with those three uh, bird processors before, 
And this year we're planning to release Osprey, which is 433 qubits, uh, demonstrating uh, further advances in, in the packaging techniques that we've, the multi-level packaging techniques that we have, as well as uh, uh, flexible uh, signal delivery. And next year we're planning to demonstrate uh, uh, Condor, which is 1,121 qubits, really pushing the envelopes of what can be done in this sort of monolithic single chip type of scaling. Now, what was discussed uh, in one of the earliest talks, though, right, was precisely how do you go beyond that, right? And, and much like it has been the case in traditional computing, modularity is the key. And so we earlier this year, we released an update to our roadmap that shows our journey towards this modular uh, scalability into the future. First, uh, giving another uh, drop point for 2023 with a new, new, new bird processor called Heron, which have improved quality factors and provide classical parallelism parallelization at the classical control level. Um, then in 2024, actually two modular scale, uh, scaled pieces, one of which is going to be chip-to-chip -chip quantum communication links, effectively increasing the lattice uh, at a chip scale without uh, reducing the, the speed or quality of the connection. Uh, but then that's not, not yet enough either because of all the physical infrastructure we, we have in these, in these systems that we build inside dilution refrigerators, we also define a quantum uh, module to module link in Flamingo, uh, which will connect three such modules to make a, a, a over 1000 qubit type system, but with a, with, it'll be a, a, a slower and, and, and lower quality link, but nonetheless give us that path towards breaking the hierarchy of some of the physical components required to scale. This all culminates in 2025 when we're planning to demonstrate Kukubara, which is over 4000 qubits combining both of these technologies, both of these sort of quantum technologies, and obviously with the classical orchestration still happening behind the scenes as well for the classical parallelization. So from a quality standpoint, I'll just uh, quickly touch on this. With superconducting qubits, I think what's been really exciting is that we have seen no end in sight in terms of continuing to improve the underlying device uh, uh, fidelities and dev device coherences. Uh, we now are seeing in certain test devices in, in the millisecond range of our coherence times, and our gate fidelities are down into 10 to the minus 3 range, uh, culminating in a demonstration of, of quantum volume of 512 earlier this year. The third aspect is speed, in that any time we were actually looking at these, these problems of interest, uh, they, re in, they require running batches and batches of circuits. We're not, they're not just single runs of, 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 of quantum circuits, but in, they'll, be, they'll involve probably millions, if not hundreds of millions of circuits. And so the speed of your circuit run is absolutely critical in order to actually get um, uh, useful information out of your quantum systems. And so uh, a big part of our uh, efforts with, with, with our, our hardware has been to improve speed both at, uh, at three levels, at the chip level, in terms of improving the, the speed of readout, at the electronics level, in terms of improving the latencies over which the classical electronics generates the, um, uh, the, the, the pulses, and then at a software and infrastructure level, bringing the, uh, the classical and quantum uh, pieces closer together in something we call Qiskit runtime to speed up the total execution uh, uh, job time that it takes to run these most complex uh, experiments. And so really the, the, the idea is that we see this path towards value well before reaching full fault tolerant quantum computing. And it's through driving through this continuous path of, 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 of improving the underlying systems um, and so, you know, we've published our roadmap that shows the full stack engagement of uh, the hardware and the software that's, that supports that above, including this, um, uh, the, this Qiskit runtime layer that, that brings the classical computation closer to the systems. Um, and then really what we see is this, this vision of how this is going to be a quantum-centric supercomputer, right? That all these pieces are going to be part of a larger fabric of computation uh, that's going to bring to, towards a user effectively uh, a serverless architecture so that you can run your problem, get it broken down into different pieces, quantum, classical, GPUs, what have you, and it can be handled at that level. And so uh, I know I'm out of time, but I did want to at least touch on these, these different pieces for you to see this vision of how it all, all ties together. And it's a really exciting time to be working in quantum-centric uh, uh, supercomputers. Thank you. It's a really nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more, or if you're able to say a little bit more about the latest advances that enabled millisecond coherence times. Uh, I mean, the, that the, the the work that we do there is a lot of it is is kind of across the full 
um, processing stack, right? Materials design, uh, it, it, it never is one thing, right? But the, it's the, the, the conglomeration of multiple advances that, that, that drives us on that path. Right? This, uh, this hybrid between quantum and classical is really interesting. Do you see any opportunity for hybrids that extend within uh, other physical qubits on the, on the quantum side? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think that the, the concept there is that you're going to have your quantum-centric supercomputer, and you're going to have your HPCs and uh, your other H traditional HPC and, and, and GPUs. But then, you know, certainly within your quantum nodes, they could be different types of underlying qubits. And then it, it all comes down to the feeds and speeds of the timescales for which you want certain problems to be addressed, right? But the whole idea is that you want to break down your problem to the point that you're only using the, the quantum part for the pieces that you... Uh, most target and most need that piece to, to, to solve. And perhaps that could be uh, a multi-qubit or, you know, multi-qubit species type of architecture as well. Yeah, do you see photonics scaling the same way like microelectronics? Yeah, uh, so photonic, photonic scaling. So, I, so we, we've issued this roadmap that shows this, this near-term scalability in terms of modular pieces. Uh, I think there's a photonic scaling piece that is the next part of the roadmap beyond. Right, which is going to involve uh, transductions, going to go get a further break out the, the the requirements of some of the infrastructure, like you know the the, the cooling pieces and, and things like that. And so you know that that helps to break out of that hierarchy of requiring you know individualized systems. This is Truman Chow from uh, University of Buffalo. Thanks for the uh, great talk. It's very exciting to see the IBM roadmaps. Uh, I'm interested in knowing your uh, thoughts on uh, scaling beyond, you know, just the supercomputer concept in terms of distributed quantum computing over, you know, uh, local area network or even wide area network. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the concept here is probably is going to be more of a local. I mean, we're certainly charting this course towards more of a local area network, right, where the, the networking is really more of the intranet. Right of of these different systems, there's a classical orchestration piece that's going to happen sort of within this this supercomputing vision. But then you know, depending on um, the technologies that get developed, like I just mentioned with you know transduction nodes and things like that, you might see more distributed uh, uh, architectures and and again involving different kinds of qubit systems too, right? And so I think the whole point is that we're just defining these different pieces. We're, we're, we're putting up at least a, a, a first framework for how we see scaling, scalability uh, can pursue, can, can, can regress. Um, but all these different pieces that, you know, repeaters, transduction, if they get realized, they're going to only add to uh, the capabilities that we can architect around. All right, we're now going to uh, turn our attention to a different type of architecture, a photonic architecture. So our next speaker is Dr. Brennan Peterson, Senior Director of Program Management at Sci Quantum. Wow, I was younger then. <laughs> um, all right, thanks all. So I'm going to go in a little bit different direction um, than the prior ones. Uh, oops, I going? Sorry, I couldn't tell if uh, up or down was, uh, was going forward. And I'm going to talk about industrialization of quantum computing. And I think, uh, um, so this is a really nice, uh, let's see, yeah, as normal. Um, one of the funny things about lasers, they no longer work on, on uh, TVs. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about how these systems work out. And this is a really nice graph from Google. But I want to start in the reverse direction. And that is from Psyquantum's perspective on quantum computing. If you start here as your end goal, the question is, how do you draw your way backwards over to here and so where we are. So really the psychonom intent is to say we want millions and multiple millions of, of bits and we want full error correction. So what's the right way to, to go down that? Of course, that's where we end up with the answer that optical is the right way because no matter what you do, somehow or other, you have to connect lots and lots of pieces. The connection of lots and lots of pieces really pushes towards photonics as a, as a solution. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we see this sort of adding together. The science side, I'm actually not going to talk about a bit because I'll be honest, I think this audience knows more than I do about all the different science pieces. 
But I do know on our photonic side, where I'll talk about, I'm really going to talk about the critical parts of the semiconductor industry and the rest of the infrastructure and how we're using that to build out. I think a key point is that in these sort of quantum architectures, or as we look forward to these new architectures, what, what we can do is if we combine the best of manufacturers, so, so most photonics, by the way, as a, as a mostly advanced semiconductor guy, photonics integration really curls my teeth. I don't have hair, it just curls my teeth. Uh, and there's a lot you can do to make things much better. And then there's, of course, large-scale infrastructure you can take advantage of. One of the things about trying to make quantum computing go much, much faster as we try to bring it in in time is we have to leverage everything out there. Right? Trying to reinvent a whole industry in a few years won't happen. A lot of this is leverage, and a lot of this is also working with partners and with other people and trying to expand. So I, I wear my program management hat when I figure out what to do. I also wear a supply chain hat when I go talk to the world and figure out who we can work with, because we really want to. Come on. All right. So there's really three tiers I want to talk about today, um, since it's short. Uh, manufacturability, which means we're going to leverage our, our best fabs, right? And there's good reasons to leverage the best fabs if you go look at it. Cooling power, because it takes a lot, you know, uh, you, running at millikelvins is very hard and expensive, right? There's a delta T fundamental issue that gets hard. And so we can actually buy the level of capacity today that we need for our long-term systems. And then connectivity. So those are sort of the three bits. And I'm going to really talk about manufacturability the very most. All right, so just to go through what the manufacturing chain looks like, because I think this gives sort of a sense of how we build what we build. You start with your uh, silicon photonics components. So we build our own integration system. We, we expand upon that. We go to silicon photonics chip layout. Again, we're just borrowing from the rest of the industry. These are old tools. We want to reuse them as much as possible. Then you go to a foundry where people dance. Um, and you make your wafers. Now, the advantage of a large-scale foundry, I'll talk about in a second, is that, again, we can reuse these techniques, but also, in a large-scale foundry, you can take advantage of newer and newer tools, right? So the, the biggest advantage is, if I run on an old 200-millimeter process, um, those are great tools, I like using them, uh, but the best case sort of lineage roughnesses I get or, or equivalent key metrics tend to be in the you're about a tenth of your critical base CDs. These, they're somewhere on the 5 to 10, maybe 20 nanometer range. Everything in quantum and everything about building the fidelity of quantum is the same about building the fidelity of the individual devices. I need sub-nanometer in every single component. I need UV characteristic capabilities at dimensions that are atypical. And this is why I have to build out on better and bigger fabs. And this is a huge part of the work and sort of the fundamental groundwork we need to lay to again, skip over an intermediate step and go to the very large scale systems. Um, I also happen to own test as one of my other jobs. And uh, um, so getting to take advantage of large scale test systems. How do I maintain yield when I discussed a little bit earlier? How do I maintain yield? How do I pretest? How do I pre-select every device that's at the peak of yield so it's the best ones? Well, I, I reuse what exists and then I make it better or more fit to the purpose that I need. So we can build our own individual you know, cryo test systems, cryoelectronic, photonic test systems. And then from that, we have lots of components and we can actually build sort of strategic yield maps of which devices we select. So just to sort of say, this is just restating this. I use CDU because I'm a semiconductor lithography person, at least in part of my heart. And so if you go look at older tools, you really are stuck with CDUs that are relatively poor. So your CD uniform, the critical dimension, the width or the equivalent, the lineage roughness is a component of that, the local CDU and the global CDU tend to be relatively poor. You get sort of shaky line behavior. Uh, often you don't, well, often things are <laughs> teeth curling. Um, really, you have to go to the best fabs. And again, it's not because they're bigger and it's not because they're richer. It's because you get to take advantage of the newest tools. I get better performance using the best new tool from a Tell or a LAM or whoever or the best new track techniques or combinations. And being intelligent about how I do that selection lets me get, and here's just a reference example that we have, um, somewhere around 1.4 nanometer, three sigma, wafer to wafer control, including locally, right? And uh, angstrom level thickness control. None of that's magical, but just having access to it gives us the fidelity we need to accelerate. 
So to go through where the, the big pieces are, we've, we've announced our work with Global Foundries. Again, we like to work globally and we like, to, we like our partners. So we have multiple full flow tape outs. We have tens of partial flow tape outs that we've run. We run quite an extensive list of chips and single parts. If you look at sort of a chip and what it does, hmm, uh, you have single photon sources, and so we work on those, and we've shown actually record performance on those. We have a good pack there. We have superconducting detectors, so you gotta detect your photons, that's why we have to cool them, so we have superconducting detectors. Um, and we have actually really high intrinsic efficiency with excellent yield and a good yield model. Uh, we also really have the beginnings of our high efficiency, high efficiency photonic switch devices. So that means we, you know, we have ways of switching, and this is early work. This isn't thermal switching. Thermal is easy. It's not enough for what we need. Um, but we have custom fabrication, films, uh, drive electronics. So this whole system, so this doesn't just stop at a chip, right? We have to build better. Uh, is really getting put together now, um, and millions of devices that we've tested so far. So there's really a long piece. Now, what we'd love to have, wow, this is sensitive. Um, high fidelity, I guess. The, uh, um, this is a picture of Slack, um, but just to give an example of the scaling on the cooling side. So I was just talking about the industrial side of the semiconductor sense. But on the cooling side, um, I would love to be able to go to a similar class facility. And this class facility exists. I can buy one today. There's five or 10 of them in the world of the scale necessary with helium level cooling. And these are, I think this is, if I remember right, an 18 megawatt facility, if I remember Slack's press releases correctly. Also, we're headquartered in Palo Alto, so it'd be nice to have on the same scale. Uh, but this is the sort of scale you can buy today. And this gives us, right, we don't have to invent something new in the cooling side. We just have to put it together in the right way. So this sort of scale, and, uh, and this exists today, is something that if we add up, we can really uh, turn into something big. And this is my last bit, which is uh, uh, to talk about sort of how this all comes together. Uh, you can kind of see that if we put this together, we have electronic chips. We've demonstrated these repeatedly. We have full temperature models all the way through from the, you know, two Kelvin all the way up to room temperature um, effective devices. Uh, direct bonded, and we've done hybrid bonding, bump bonding, wire bonding, whatever sort of bonding that we can find to get the right answer that we need. We have uh, optical I.O. Um, there's many different types, and so we bond that together, and your photonic chip, which is really the heart of this. And importantly, also the fiber connection that will go connect this both internally into multi-module systems. Right in the end, these will look like servers. There'll be chips connected to other chips. Those chips will be stacked in arrays. Those arrays will be connected to other arrays. It's all the same fibers that go between these. Uh, and so just getting all of these parts um, it's a big chunk of the, the actual work. And then test it, both test it on this level, this level, as stacks, and then as integrated devices. So this is sort of the integrated scheme. And I think a big part of establishing an industry is making sure you have that sort of test level understanding all the way through and end to end. So that's my very short introduction into sort of the industrialization. But I do think this is um, really a key opportunity and I don't see a gap towards building quantum computers at a very large scale in the not too distant future, right? None of these are unknown technologies. We can borrow and leverage extensively, and we have a powerful way of making these uh, in the very near term. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think the first answer is a chip. Uh, it depends on which chip you want to do. We do have ones that we build of different sorts, and so uh, I mean well-published, right? You can have a heralding chip, which has a source, a herald, and then some circuitry at the end with detection. You can reconnect in different ways. And I think also in, uh, so it's just a choice of how we want to lay out. And it would depend on the use case for, for where we want mid-chip detection, right? I apologize. I'm going to ask the same question about scalability like to the previous presenter. Uh, you mentioned that scalability is not an issue. Uh, to my knowledge, every single function in a quantum processor, a quantum information science processor, the sources, the detectors, the switches, the routers, the memories, light matter interaction takes place at different wavelengths in different materials. If you want to stitch these together, you're going to have to put 
uh, different types of materials, working at different types of wavelengths, mode mismatch, wavelength mismatch, scalability. You know, you need mode converters and wavelength converters at a large scale. How is that not a challenge in terms of losses? Uh, so let me see if I can add up. You're saying the, the challenge fundamentally on each of these parts is a multi-wavelength, uh, multi-source, but an interconnect and multi-materials challenge at quantum. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's if if I knew if we knew every single answer at full scale, of course we'd be done, and we probably wouldn't be here. I would hire you all, and then we'd go build things. Oh, so I don't. So when I say scale, I don't mean that we're done and nothing has an open question left. And I think I don't want to leave. I probably did leave that impression uh, a little bit, but it's a little fun. So uh, all of these require some material advantage, right? So we still have to build better sources at high fidelity. We'd love to build sources. I would love to have a single photon on demand source that would make my life in, in build much, much better. Uh, switches is still a lot of materials work, but there's no fundamental physics between where we need to be. There's an awful lot of engineering. By the way, there was no fundamental physics between a CMOS processor of 1970 and a CMOS processor of 2022. That doesn't mean there's not an awful lot of work between those two endpoints. And so what I say is that knowing, sort of uh, putting my material science hat on, knowing the fundamentals of how cryogenic materials work, how the optics work, uh, how these different things interact, there's work to be done. And a tremendous amount of work will have to be done to build these systems. But uh, there's no gap where I say, and then a new physics must be invented, or a material that I can't connect to, or some equivalent to that. All of those are answerable questions that build off an existing infrastructure. And from there, that's how we build. So yes, there's plenty of research. And I'm not saying that's done. I'm saying that the research can have a very clear line between where we are today and where we want to end. All right. Let's thank your speaker once again. See, our last talk uh, for this morning session. Uh, Chris Monroe couldn't be with us today, so uh, Professor Jung Sang Kim, uh, who we heard from earlier, has graciously agreed to step in and literally, as he said, switch hats here. So we, we all know he's at Duke, but uh, co founder as well at INQ and the Chief Technology Officer. So, with that, John Sang. All right, well, it's, uh, it's not easy to follow um, two of an outstanding talks from some of our um, you know, partners, uh, not partners, but collaborators in the industry, but I think this is a good thing, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so um, I hope I got the next set of slides in order, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, it's on. Ah, there we go. All right, so. I'm gonna put a different hat on, um, and it, it's actually just a set of slides that I prepared in the earlier talk that I didn't get to share. Um, um, and it's not as organized as some of the, uh, the other two, but I'll just, uh, uh, for this part of the talk, I um, have to put up the, the slide. Um, a lot of this is kind of, um, kind of our, our look into the future. So uh, there are some legal disclaimers. All right, so maybe I'll just dive a little bit into how we build our uh, quantum computers and trapped ion technology. I, I talked about the physics and the, and, and the basics. Um, and here, you know, this shows um, one of the, uh, some of the things we do in a fairly routine way these days. Um, and you can see um, that in this picture, we're, you're, you're seeing those dots show up. And what we're doing is we're loading individual atoms uh, in that loading zone, which is on, this, on the lower left-hand corner of the trip. And then we're moving the ions into the quantum regime by uh, changing the voltages. This is all just done by uh, vo uh, changing voltages on the, on the electrodes. Uh, and then we can actually, oops, um, let me see if I can, and, and you, we can typically, I, I hit it too many times, it just jumped up. Okay. Yeah, so um, at the end of the day, you will see that uh, we can actually build up any uh, ion chain with any length, um, and then we can actually make them equidistant. Um, and then we can actually bring in laser beams to, to work on them. And, then, and that number N is completely programmable once our system is constructed. Um, and here we, it shows how the circuit goes. So first we shine a laser beam to initialize all the ions into, into the uh, into zero initial state. And as, uh, as Jerry mentioned, there are these uh, quantum circuits. And as, as you go through these gates on the circuits, all of that 
is programmable laser beams. And uh, the nice thing about that is we can actually make um, entangling gates between arbitrary pairs of the, the qubits in the chain, and we can sometimes run uh, multiple gates in parallel as well. When you're all done, uh, we shine um, a different color of laser beam. I mean, some ions will glow and others will stay dark, and that actually tells us whether the output is zero or one. We can read it out uh, that way. Uh, so this is how the, the very simple uh, schematic of how our system works. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about how we um, think about the metrics. Uh, I could get a little bit more uh, in terms of how we define our algorithmic qubits. A lot, again, the spirit is to start with a um, user. Um, somehow it's not progressing. Can I actually give you, prompt you to, to yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you click through one more. Um, the, the idea is to use algorithms to run benchmarks. And again, in QEDC, a um, uh, subcommittee has come up with a list of algorithms and how, um, and all of these uh, standard algorithms are actually defined in a standard form using uh, IBM's Qiskit. And then everybody runs it. Um, and then you're allowed to uh, do a little bit of compilation and so on. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, so what we did is based on this uh, algorithm-based uh, so-called volumetric benchmark, we uh, try to extract one number, and the, and the number is extracted like this. So we, that's what we call an algorithmic qubit. You click to the next one. Um, it's an ability to run an algorithm of a typical size where uh, you need n qubits. You use n qubits and run about n squared entangling gate operations. Okay, so that's the, 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 the size and complexity of the circuit uh, that we're, 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 we're doing. Um, and, and that's kind of roughly what it translates to. If you click to the next one, this is actually a volumetric benchmark and it improves as your fidelity of the gate improves and you have a better connected <laughs> architecture, uh, which is again, the, the direct benefits that a user would see. And if you click to the next one, um, and we feel that although it's not a, a scientifically proven boundary, uh, we feel like the quantum advantage is achieved when you have an algorithmic qubits of about 60 or higher, meaning you have 60 qubits on which you can run about three or 4,000 entangling gate operations. And at that point, I think that cal calculation becomes pretty complicated to, to simulate it on, on a classical computer. All right, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is how we, uh, we measure these things. I um, mean, here, um, you know, any uh, standard benchmark has a version because it's a, it's a fairly rigorously defined thing of how you're gonna measure it. Uh, so on this plot, um, again, we're, we're adopting a lot of these ideas from the QEDC paper. Uh, on the vertical axis, you have the circuit width. This is how many qubits are you exercising to run this algorithm. And on the horizontal axis, we have a logarithmic scale of number of entangling gate operations that are in the standard circuit, okay? And you can see that um, you know, some algorithms like the phase estimation, Hamiltonian simulation, and quantum Fourier transform, they involve about n squared uh, gates. So they go up uh, kind of uh, quadratically uh, onto that side. And you know, some of these VQE amplitude estimation and Monte Carlo sampling, these are fairly deep circuits. They, they, their circuit depth actually goes exponentially with the number of qubits. So you can see that those actually span out uh, very uh, rapidly to the right. And so what we do is we try to create a rectangle um, that has n qubits on the vertical axis, n squared entangling gates on the horizontal axis, um, with a size defined so that every circuit within this box actually succeeds. It succeeds with a probability of one over E. Roughly, and that threshold is is you know picked uh, out of convenience. Um, so what this means is, um, if your certain um, circuits don't succeed with high enough probability, you should continue to shrink that box until until you define a box within which every every implementation of the algorithm actually succeeds. Uh, so that's how we um, extract the size of that box, and that's what we call an algorithmic qubit. It's really kind of defined from a um, utilization point of view, um, and there are a couple of things that are allowed to do. So the standard um, algorithm benchmarking circuit is uh, given by, um, by actually we just pulled the one that uh, was defined by the QEDC subcommittee, but you're allowed to compile it. If you actually have, uh, can take advantage of your quantum computer to take that circuit and make it more efficient, meaning using smaller number of gates to do exactly the same unitary operation, uh, that's allowed to do. You're allowed to have innovation in your compiling space. As long as you're not, um, kind of making specific adjustments um, that are very special to that specific implementation of the circuit, right? So you're allowed to innovate on, on compiling and you're also, also allowed to innovate on uh, error mitigation. I think many physical platforms, they're starting, we're starting to understand both in superconducting qubits and ion traps um, and many other platforms as well, that some of these errors tend to be much more systematic. Uh, so you have a, a, a very nice way to mitigate uh, those errors. Again, without 
a specific reference to an implementation and algorithm if you can actually generically uh, improve your mitigation you're allowed to do it so with these two allowed innovations uh, we try to see what is the most complex circuit that your your, your users can can run um, in some of these listed uh, things so that's kind of where where we are um, some of our um, uh, aria system our latest inq system has an algorithmic qubit of about 20 meaning uh, based on these six algorithms you can run about 20 qubits and uh, that in, that um, includes up to about 400 entangling pairs um, and we're, we're succeeding with those of uh, the probability of, of success is, is uh, higher than one over e so again this is uh, like i think uh, one interesting uh, way to approach uh, the standardization if you go to the next slide um, i will actually then uh, just speculate a little bit about you know how do you get into the scaling future so you know, we, I showed you that massive uh, laboratory experiment. That's the state of status where, of where we were. Um, I also introduced a lot of the, the miniaturization technology that we have worked into the, in, uh, in the past. Uh, but really, in order to, to get to a large scale quantum computer that's universally fault tolerant, we have to do error correction. That means there will be overhead. That means you have to put a lot of uh, numbers of qubits together. And eventually, you have to integrate them into, into large scale um, uh, systems. So if you click to the next slide, you know, one uh, way to do that is what we call a multi-core architecture. I told you about we have a, a single chain, but you can actually put multiple chains onto a single chip. And, and this is actually um, the, the video on top is actually a real live, um, not, not live as a real, but those are real ions that, are, that we're moving around. Um, and the idea is here we have a four sections of um, you know, 16 qubits. And you can actually bring any pair of them together as long as they're, they're uh, aligned next to each other. And that allows us to um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, do eventually do a calculation across all 64 uh, ions in the chain. And that's what we call a multi-core architecture, very similar to putting multiple cores of uh, processors into, into a unit. Um, so that we, we believe that we can also, at the same time, we can increase the length of each chain. We can also integrate multiple chains into the system. That's like a, a first strategy uh, to scale. The second strategy, which is in the next uh, slide, um, is uh, this photonic interconnects. And this is very similar to how we build uh, massive uh, supercomputers today. Uh, we, we start from a highly uh, integrated silicon chip, uh, CPU, but we don't actually make the silicon chip the size of a football field. What we do is we build these small quantum, uh, uh, these uh, pizza box computers, and then we, we stack hundreds of thousands of these computers that are individually verified, and then we connect them through a network so that we can actually parallelize the operations. Right? So that's how we build the, the most massively parallel computers today. Um, and the idea is similar. Once we know how to build one of these boxes, uh, the idea is to make sure that we can communicate photon you know, through photonics, um, we can communicate entanglement among, among the chains. If you click to the next slide, uh, the architecture we have is uh, we could actually do this across using a, a fully non-blocking optical cross-connect switch. Um, and that allows us to uh, create entanglement between any pair of modules within our system. Okay, because that's uh, a all -to -all, again, all to all connected optical switch. Um, and for example, in this case, we show an eight, um, um, QPUs um, that have, in this example, eight qubits each, within which everything is connected. And between these modules, you can also have a direct connection. So you can take any uh, qubit in any one of these modules and make a connection through only a single hop. Okay? And that type of architecture allows us uh, to, to make a highly um, you know, connected um, uh, multi-computer module. So if you look at the next slide, you know, there is, this technology has been proposed very early on. Actually, um, the first demonstration of an entanglement generation across uh, two different ion traps in two different vacuum chambers through this photonic uh, connection was, it was demonstrated in my colleague Chris Monroe's lab in 2007. So it's about 15 years old um, in the past. Um, and then over the years, uh, that initial connection uh, rate was really slow. We were creating one entangled pair uh, over like 20 minutes. So that's like really slow connection. It's like you're trying to connect two computers with a, a very old uh, modem um, that communicates at maybe you know, 10 kilobit per second. Then it's very hard to build high performance computers. But of course, those networks over time has improved. Today, you know, the, in, in, a, in a typical data center, you, you sometimes are starting to see some of these optical backbones uh, that are connecting at a very high scale. Uh, so we've been the community has been working on improving uh, the speed of that inter interface uh, dramatically. Uh, so we went from one every thousand seconds uh, to about 200 events a second 
over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, and some of this work uh, was done by researchers who are currently here at AFRL. Uh, some of them were um, done by other researchers uh, in the community uh, overseas. Uh, but we have actually made five orders of magnitude improvement in communication speed over the course of the last 12 or 13 years. And what, uh, today, if we can actually push it by another factor of 50 or so, then um, the uh, connection speed becomes comparable to the gate speed that is internal. And that allows us to actually start building uh, systems that are uh, practically useful. Um, and this actually shows a picture of me uh, about 20 years ago. Um, I actually personally built one of the largest optical cross-connect switches in the world. Um, and that record actually stands uh, till this day. <laughs> it just happened to be 20 years ahead of our time. Um, and that's a 1296 optical port switch. Um, and we actually demonstrated 1100 ports that are working, meaning 1100 inputs that can connect to any of the 1100 outputs in all to all connectivity. That's 1100 squared, which is about 1.2 million connections we had to verify. Okay? So this type of technology exists. And what this means is if you know how to build these quantum computers in a massive way, um, there is a technology that allows you to connect thousands of these quantum computers uh, to make a massively interconnected quantum computer. Um, so um, in order to do that, I think we need more investment in integrated optics and photonics technologies and miniaturization technologies. If you go to the next slide, um, we feel like there is a, a very rapid progression in technology. Um, now, if, if you're, one of your systems look like that on the left, it's very hard to build a thousand of those things, right? But in order to actually be able to build a large number of things, we actually have to continue the push of the integration so that our systems become more and more modular, again, pulling in integrated photonics and all of these new enabling technologies, uh, so that you know, each of those units become manageable. And then we can actually start to build large numbers and connect them together and hopefully get to a, a, a scaling feature um, in, in, in a reasonable uh, time scale, hopefully sometime this decade. All right, uh, with that, I think the next slide probably shows um, our roadmap. Again, our roadmap is uh, given in, in terms of this algorithmic qubits. Um, in the beginning, our algorithmic qubit uh, improvement is quite modest because we're just comp controlling uh, and improving our gate fidelity. But it really starts to rise when we actually introduce some error correction to run, uh, to be able to run deeper circuits. So um, again, of course, along all of these lines, we're continuing to scale our system so we can at some point introduce error correction and, and swallow that overhead and still make sure that we can run very deep circuits. Uh, so I think we, we feel that uh, the real breakpoint to actually um, you know, you know, introduce these um, different components to scale so that we can deploy error correction is probably sometime in the middle of this decade, and that's a couple of years out. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done uh, to be able to hit those marks. All right, and the next slide I think is the last one. Oh, sorry, this is, yeah. Um, actually, let's just click through this because it's the same summary and conclusions um, I, I mentioned in the past. And I'd like to thank everybody and, and uh, part of our team uh, who has come, uh, made all of these things possible. All right, with that, I'd be happy to take some more questions. Thank you for a great talk. I was curious about miniaturizing the laser itself. I mean, can that be made in such a way that gives you the fidelity that you need? Yeah, I think the, the answer there is yes. Um, I mean, right now our laser systems are pretty big because we, we, we use these research prototypes that people build. Um, but uh, you know, if you look at the progression of the laser integration in say optical communications, even 20 years ago when I was looking, working on it, uh, you know, the, the, these optical modules were pretty big. They had fibers in it and so on. Uh, but today they're all they're all integrated onto a chip. So um, and and even you know ten years before that, some of these long distance transmission systems used to occupy many many racks of equipment. So um, the, um, the the there is a sufficient progress and demonstration in telecom wavelengths that these types of integration can be done, and there has been uh, industry driven investments to make that technology happen. Um, there isn't as much. Uh, demand for that at these wavelengths that are needed for quantum computing. Um, but I do believe that technology capabilities uh, and opportunities are there. Now, given there are different wavelengths and so on, there's more work that needs to be done. Um, but I don't feel those are fundamental limits. It's more of a technical investment that we have to make. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, I think the answer is yes. If we have one unit, we need one set of lasers. If we have a thousand units, um, we may need a thousand lasers, but, but probably not. I think we can actually start to share one laser across multiple units. But as the system scales, yeah, I mean, as your as your number of pizza boxes increases, you need more power, you need more resources, and so on. Uh, so yeah, I think there is opportunity for um, for sharing resources, but definitely the, the the resource as the computer scales will probably have to go go larger. Um, and I think that that is that is true. Mark. Yeah, no, that, that's that, that's a good question. I think you know this um, the 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 specific implementation of VQE and and, and there it's it's just it's just um, it's just picked by the committee, right? So we're we're sticking to that standard ways. Now, is that the most efficient VQE you can think of? The answer probably is no. I think there's a lot of uh, room for continuing the innovation, but in order to um, define a way to to strictly measure that, we have to start from a common um, and agreed upon uh, standard circuits. And that's what the committee at QEDC has picked, and so the implementation is Qiskit. Um, and then, and then, so we're just running that standard circuit. All right. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. This draws our morning session to a close. Let me turn it over to Melissa Talman. Tell us about lunch. Thank you, Dr. Hadek. I hope everybody enjoyed the first part of the morning session. We look forward to meeting you all back here at 1.30. At this time, we will depart for lunch. If you have a red ticket, we do have GI staff that will guide you down to the box lunch areas. Uh, for those that have brought lunch or that would like to utilize, we have food trucks on hand out in the parking lot. Um, everyone is able and more than welcome to go ahead and join us inside the hangar. There's two certain areas to uh, enter the hangar. You can do so going down the south, well, south side stairwell, outside to the food trucks and immediately into the hangar, or you can stay internally inside the facility and just go down to the first floor where GI staff will be able to guide you. Once you're there, uh, if you have a red ticket, please hand that over. If you were able to go ahead and pick out your lunch choices prior to, we have a printout of everybody uh, that has done so. If you did not make any selections, we do have a vegetarian and a meat selection that was provided for you on your behalf. So thank you. We look forward to seeing you guys at 1.30.